What would a potential Gotham future look like if Batman himself didn't exist? This is the Comic Story and Channel where I take some of your favorite trade paperbacks and single issues and I break them down into digestible bites to help you understand. Then I read them dramatically back to you. All alterations to the panels, text, and images are to prevent copyright problems and all art is owned by its respective companies. Today we're going to be doing another full story in which we grab a bunch of the issues that we covered here on the channel on a weekly basis and we turn them into one giant video to help you understand what is happening in a better format. Today we're going to be looking at the other side of Future State. You see, Future State was a series of stories that were told a little while ago that told a potential future for DC Comics. They were all about two to four different issues. But during all of these Future State books, there was a series known as the Future State Gotham series of books, and it basically told a future with Batman. So you're going to get the stories of Next Batman, Outsiders, Dark Detective, Grifter, Robin Eternal, Nightwing, Batgirls, Catwoman, Red Hood, Arkham Knights, and Batman Superman. The timeline should generally go, Batman Superman is the origin of everything happening in Gotham, and then all of the side books leading up to Next Batman and Dark Detective. It's not going to be a perfect timeline because it wasn't a perfect timeline, but we're going to give you a pretty close semblance of what it should be. Hope you guys enjoy Future State Gotham City. Gotham City, the beginning of the occupation. Batman steps through the room, rats shift and squeak on the floor. Eyes open over their bodies and shoot heat vision at him. So he dodges, moving to the door. Huh. He grunts as he opens it to reveal the greenish light of kryptonite, which causes the rats to flee. Oh hell, Batman whispers as he steps into the room. You see, yesterday in Metropolis, the young boy was hanging over the railing, aiming down at the oncoming train. Be brave, Sander. You could do this, the boy whispers to himself. It's the only way out, he shouts as he jumps down to face the oncoming train. But Superman is there, stopping the train before it can hit him. It's never the only way out, Xander. Superman says, putting a hand on the boy's shoulder. He flies the boy away, and in a short time, Xander is explaining the problem to Superman. He tells him that he wanted to pull off an epic prank at school, so he discovered the false face serum. He shows Superman by putting the device against his own neck and changing his face. Xander's face then alters to that of a giant ram. Our mascot's the ram, so you know, he says, but he explains that the serum has had some side effects. Even when it's off, I get nervous, he explains, pointing to the ram's horns that grow out of his forehead. I can't control it. Who's going to date a guy with horns on his head? Xander asks. Superman leaves Xander with Dr. Veritas, and after doing a little research, she discovers that the false face serum originates in Gotham. So a short time later, Superman is flying next to the Batwing. It's been a while, he shouts to his friend. What are you doing? Get inside the Batwing now! Batman shouts as Superman gets on board. It's nice to see you, Bruce, he tells him. But Batman explains that the Batwing is cloaked against their surveillance drones. Unlike your bright red cape, he growls. Superman looks at his friend, asking who they are, and Batman glances at his friend. You're a reporter, Clark. How have you not heard about this? He questions. But Superman waves it off, explaining that Metropolis has its own issues, and he asks Batman about the false face serum. I hadn't realized the serum made it over to Metropolis, but I've been tracking it here. It's growing in popularity, Batman explains. And in the dark alleyway, three teenagers with animal heads throw a Molotov cocktail at one of the magistrate drones. The drone hits the ground and the teens start to stomp on it. Stop all movement. Prepare for punishment determination. One of the cyber says as it comes down to the alleyway, leveling its armed guns at the teens. It opens fire, but the round bounces off the chest as Superman. Not today, he says with a smile, and he scans the robot, realizing that there is nothing human inside, and he takes it down with one punch. Elsewhere in Gotham, the peacekeepers watch the fight through the cyber's camera, and form the professor that his wish just came true. One of the peacekeepers nod. In the alleyway, Batman throws a bolo at the fleeing teens, asking if Superman heard anything he told him back at the Batwing about the magistrate surveillance drones. People's lives were in danger, Clark argues, and as the teens struggle to their feet, they ask Batman not to hurt them. He's not going to hurt you. Depends on whether or not I get answers. Batman tells them with a growl, demanding to know where they got the drug. The teens quickly begin to spill their guts, and one of the girls explained that her father has gone missing and the authorities insisted that he left on his own. He tells Superman that the magistrate treats them like vermin. We're showing them that vermin can fight back. We're going to bring down as many of their goons and drones as we can until they release the people that they've kidnapped or kill us, she explains. You still haven't answered my question. Where'd you get it? 
Batman demands. The bird-headed teen tells him that they got the drug from a dealer that they met in a creep hospital. When suddenly the one with the bug head yells and tries to hit Superman with a bat. The teen yells running off into the night. Some people do need masks. You're right, Batman. Superman nods as he watches the teens run away. I know. Batman nods. But a dangerous street drug isn't the solution. I want it out of my city, he tells him. So they head back into old Gotham, beneath the modern streets of the city, and they pass through the droves of homeless that call this dark place home, eventually arriving at the old hospital. Follow my lead. We're going in as discreetly as we can, Batman tells his friend. Got it. Discreet. Superman nods, and inside they find the high-tech interior of the building doesn't seem to match the outside of it. Impossible. All of this is funded by selling street drugs at $20 a pop. Let's see what we can find out, Batman whispers. He finds a computer and begins to look through the files, when suddenly there's a snort from the shadows, and two genetically altered human-animal hybrids rush them. I need more time! Batman says as he glances over his shoulder. I've got you covered, Superman tells him, and he hits the first hybrid, knocking him through one of the walls, but the other one clocks him in the jaw, showing that their strength is augmented as well. He hits the second one, quickly moving to take the serum injector from the thug's neck, and as he looks up, he sees a frogman standing before him. Hello, Superman, the frog says simply. My name is Mr. Toad, and I am the leader of the False Face Society, Mr. Toad explains. Elsewhere, Batman smiles as he finds out who is funding the False Face Serum. He downloads the data before turning and realizing that the building has gone silent. He feels it in his bones. Clark is in trouble. Batman looks up. Superman is strapped to a table, pushed along by Mr. Toad, flanked by a goat octopus man. Back away from Superman, now! Batman orders, but Mr. Toad just keeps moving. Make sure he doesn't follow, he tells the goat man, and the goat quickly moves, its giant octopus tentacles swirling around as he threatens Batman, but Batman just ducks and throws a small device that attaches to the goat's head. A concussion shockwave rips through his head, knocking him unconscious in seconds, and he moves to the window, watching Mr. Toad drive away. But the tentacles then twitch, and Batman remembers that octopuses also have neurons in their arms. He's thrown out the window, landing hard on the concrete below, his leg twisting at an odd angle. The homeless man that helped Superman earlier tries to move to help Batman, but he orders him to get back. While he's almost certain that these people aren't working for the Magistrate, he doesn't want to take that chance. He calls his bike over, limping towards it, mounting it, and with a roar, he drives off into the night. Meanwhile, at their secret lair, Mr. Toad wheels the unconscious Superman into the room. I must admit, I had my doubts about you, but you proved yourself quite worthy of the name, Mr. Toad. Professor Pig tells his associate. Toad glares at the villain, reminding him to keep the magistrate away from his daughter. Pig snorts as he picks up a kryptonite bit and begins to place it on his drill. And as he walks over to the table, Superman struggles. Superman, you're awake! How delightful! <laughs> Pig snorts. Where am I? Superman struggles as he tries to sit up. But later, Batman surveys the city. He placed the cryogenic sleeve on his leg to heal it and tried to track Superman. He looks through the files that he downloaded, aware that the false face serum is actually manufactured by the Magistrate. He knows that they have Clark somewhere, and he just has to find him. But in Pig's operating room, Superman looks over at Mr. Toad. He's still weak from the kryptonite that is strapped to his chest. What did Pig do to me? Best not to ask, Mr. Toad tells the hero simply. Superman doesn't understand. He knows that Mr. Toad wasn't lying before, and he questions why he is working for Pig. I underestimated my opponent, Superman. Now I'm paying the price. I'm simply ensuring that my family doesn't have to pay too, Toad tells him. Is betraying your own beliefs the best way to protect your family? Superman asks him. Meanwhile, out in the city, Batman stumbles across one of the Magistrate Cybers. The robot scans him, announcing that his mask is lined with lead in violation of the city's laws. Batman dodges behind cover as the robot opens fire on him, and as he comes out fast, he stuns the enemy with batarangs before knocking its head off. He follows the signal, looking down on the building in the darkness. He then slips past the guards, finding a way inside, and it is then that he discovers that the Magistrate has begun creating synthetic kryptonite. He turns at the sound of a voice as Pig enters the room, glaring at the villain. I'm surprised they haven't locked you up yet. The Magistrate isn't too fond of masks, Batman remarks, but Pig snorts in laughter. What? They make exceptions for surgeons. I heard you visited my little club. Did you enjoy yourself? 
Pig asks, explaining that when the magistrate discovered the False Face Society, it had planned to destroy them. But Pig convinced them that the best way to track the descendants was to take charge of those descendants. And now I have my best Mr. Toad ever, an artist like me. Oh, the masterpieces that we've created together. Pig snorts as he places two of the false face devices on his arms, and his hands transform before Batman, becoming two massive boar's heads. Elsewhere in the building, Mr. Toad is helping Superman escape, but they suddenly stop as they hear a growling coming from the shadows. It's one of Mr. Pig's creations, Toad yells as a massive mutated version of Superman steps out of the darkness. Stay behind me. Superman orders, and the monster blasts Superman with heat vision from his eight eyes. But the Man of Steel deflects it, knocking the monster through the wall. Bats! Superman shouts as he lands in the room. Soups. Batman nods. Superman knows that Batman is relieved to see him. He almost never calls him Soups. The two friends step back to back as Batman explains that Pig has given himself the strength of ten wild boars. Let's trade, Batman says. Superman doesn't know if that's such a good idea. I don't have bad ideas. We're trading. Batman tells him as he twirls to face the multi-eyed monster. Batman leaps into the air, and once he's far enough from Clark, he pulls the shards of kryptonite out of his cape, stabbing them into the monster's chest. It growls with pain and falls to the floor, allowing Batman to remove the mutation device. Superman doesn't have to do much. He moves fast, punching Pig in the face, knocking him to the ground. Superman's eyes burn with anger as he thinks about how Pig used him as a lab experiment. This entire facility is dedicated to your awful experiments. Do me a favor, Mr. Toad. Pull the fire alarm. Superman unleashes his heat vision on the facility, burning it to the ground, and quickly, the two heroes manage to pull everyone to safety. The next day, Batman calls on the aid of Animal Man, and he helps them remove the extra DNA from the animals in the city, while Batman removes the transmission chips. Inside one of his micro bat caves, Batman and Superman survey the city, Clark turning to his friend. We've crippled the Magistrate's bioengineering operations, but we haven't put him out of commission. But Batman interrupts him. There's no we. I'm doing this one alone, Batman tells him. And he explains that the Magistrate has already begun to grow synthetic kryptonite. That they knew Superman would come. That he is a liability. He explains that Superman can't be trusted. You don't see them for what they actually are. They're not a terror organization. They didn't invade Gotham. We invited them. We let our fear, anger, and other base emotions overrule our judgment. The Magistrate captured you once, they'll do it again. But next time, they'll be unstoppable, Batman tells him. But Superman begins to argue. And so Batman pulls out a device that has been armed with Superman's DNA and sends a blast of heat vision that Clark barely avoids. And he holds it up. Gotham won't survive a militia armed with your DNA, Clark. There's no place for trust in Gotham, he tells him. But before Superman can continue to argue, Batman narrows his eyes. Get out of my city, he growls. And finally, Superman begins to fly away. He believes Batman, trusts him with the city, whether you like it or not. In Metropolis, Mr. Toad returns home, hugging his daughter, when suddenly there's a rush of air and their mailbox rattles. They open it to reveal a letter from Superman. If you need help, call me with this. The note reads, and they smile as they look at the signal device. The Magistrate Jones open fire on the mass criminals, and as they open fire, they leap through the air, bringing it down into a fiery crash. Stop all movement! By order of the Magistrate! The Peacekeepers command. Laser sights locked onto our mass criminals, and as they open fire, they bring down some of the drones, but they still have no chance, until suddenly one of the armored vans is crushed as Clayface roars, smashing into it. Other former villains of the city step into the battle, flying the flag of the Arkham Knight. We do not fear the wasteland, the Arkham Knight thinks to herself as she orders her knights into battle. As the fight continues, the Arkham Knight walks over to the mass criminals. I've bought you time. Now get your injured to safety, quickly, she tells them. They gather the wounded and they begin to limp away. Thanks for the assist. Good luck with curfew, the leader tells the knight. The Arkham Knight looks around the area. This sector of the city is known as the wasteland, and it is under full martial law of Peacekeeper 12. The people cannot protest, they cannot raise their voices, and they cannot cry or mourn, and that is why she is here. To fight against tyranny with the light of the sun, Two-Face steps from her group of knights, telling her that their primary target is on the move, and that the Magistrate Jones are converging on his position. We need to get there right now or we'll lose them, he warns. Mr. Dent, get everyone to move out in 30 seconds, Astrid orders him. She walks over to Blight, seeing the knight is struggling with pain. 
When we get back to the base, I will order our doctors to administer another dose of the serum. It will pass, I promise you. She assures him, and Asher moves to see if the others are ready. Copperhead looks off into the distance, warning the group of knights about the drones that are incoming. Mr. Dumpty, Mr. Clay, I expect full suppression of this attack. Mr. Dent, the doctor and I will move ahead and track our target. Astrid orders, drawing her sword. And as the magistrate forces descend on the knights, the powerhouses move to attack. The scene becomes a massive battle as Astrid leads the others away, Dent keeping a look at his tracker, trying to follow the signal as the battle continues. They follow the sewer lines, and their target is moving underground. But suddenly, the signal is lost. I don't understand. I can't track him, Astrid. We'll have to go down there, Dent warns her. A drone falls from the sky, cracking the pavement, creating a hole in the sewers. The knights leap into the darkness, and as they split up, they have Astra's orders to suppress the target, not kill him. It doesn't take long until their lights are playing off the scales of Killer Croc. But the other hits him with a stunning shock, and he falls into the sewer water disoriented. Psycho Pirate pulls up his pistol, shooting the drone out of the sky. Stay back, just Dent and I! Astra orders as she pushes through the scummy water. Just do it! Kill me now and make it quick! Croc rumbles at them as he tries to pull himself up, but Astrid lowers the point of her sword at Croc's neck. Now, Mr. Croc, will you swear fealty to the cause of the Arkham Knights? Will you accept your position as a cast-off from society? And so use this as a guiding principle to reshape it. Do I have a choice? Croc asks, and Astrid takes her sword, preparing to stab downward, but she suddenly tucks it to her side, reaching out her hand. Yes, always. Later, the knights regroup at Wayne Manor, and Astrid and Dent move through the hallways of the Great House. She makes sure that the men have been rested and fed, as well as scheduled for their mandatory therapy sessions. The men must concentrate on their mental well-being, as well as their physical selves, she reminds Dent, and in the next room they find Croc. The villain floats in a tank, having been put into a coma to help speed up the healing of his wounds. Have we locked our primary target? Astrid asks as they come to another door, and Dent nods. Yes. Our scanners indicate that it's being kept atop an old police precinct in the fifth ward. He tells her. She steps out into the rain, discovering blight in the balcony. He turns to her, telling her that the rain soothed his skin. She nods and asks if the serum helped at all. No, it feels like needles now. I just want the pain to stop. He tells her, and he kneels down to her, telling her that he doesn't think the sun will come out for him. She reaches down, taking his face into her hands. We will find a cure, I promise. And when we do, you'll stand with me beside our brother and sisters. And a new day will dawn on you. Beneath the city, Peacekeeper 12 leads his forces through the sewers. He knows that there were six to ten knights, meta-powered. He reports in the command. It isn't Batman or any of his people. We've gathered reports suggesting that it may be a group that emerged from Arkham Asylum. Peacekeeper 1 tells him over the holocom, and Peacekeeper 12 knows what to do. I will tear this sector apart! You have my word. 12 tells his superior. The wasteland is torn apart. The magistrate cracks down on the citizens, trying to draw the knights out, and it wasn't long before they attacked, backed up by the very citizens of the sector. The Arkham Knights are the light and the darkness of the world. The battle between the knights and the magistrate lasted for some time, and during it, Dent had confirmation that their primary target was at the police precinct. Astrid nodded as she raised her shield. Then that is where we will go, right after we finish here. Croc was set loose, finally swearing fealty to Astrid and her cause, and it wasn't long until Peacekeeper 12 was defeated, his helmet stuck on a pike as a warning to the Magistrate. Deep in the cave below Wayne Manor, Two-Face calls a meeting telling everyone that he needs them to listen up. Astrid and he have identified their main target's location. They've all been apprised of the details. The engineers have put the finishing touches on the support craft, they commandeered from Townsend Air Force Base. Their assault begins tomorrow. Zaz begins to play with his knife, asking, And why should we be listening to this weakling? Astra steps in, stating that she will allow good-natured chiding because it does wonders for morale. But she trusts that the ribbing will be the extent of it. Mr. Dent is her first lieutenant. Please afford the same courtesy that you would afford her as the Arkham Knight. Two-Face clears his throat, continuing to state that the Magistrate's forces are concentrated by the police precinct and city hall. They have reacquisitioned an abandoned bank as a storage area. It is believed to be a replacement peacekeeper, designated Six. He has assembled a massive cache of Magistrate weaponry at this location. And guess what? This is where they will be going. They will be flying right into the heart of it. But as Astrid and the others get ready, she notices that they are short one member. 
Two-Face says that Phosphorus hasn't been feeling himself. The sedatives are having less and less effect on his pain levels. As morning comes, Astrid leads the charge on the Magistrate, not as Joan, but as a Manorinus. A Manorinus was the queen of the Kush in the days of Augustus and the Empire of Rome. She was never, ever afraid. Today, she is Amarinus, and her subjects will punish their enemies. Astrid's teams quickly begin to dismantle their opposition, but soon, Phosphorus can feel his body giving way. Astrid holds him, stating that he will not succumb. He is a knight of Arkham, and he will endure for their common cause. Now fight, damn you! Phosphorus tells her that it's not the fighting, it's the only distraction that he has. It's the silent moments! It's the sleep! All the pieces you never see that I never tell you about. I can't try to survive for the gift of a life of agony. Peacekeeper 6 tells the Magistrate to brace themselves. An aircraft is on its way to try and take equipment. They think that, but at that moment the radio signals that the enemy isn't going towards the cache. They're going inside of the police precinct. Astrid and her knights rush to the top of the building and begin to disconnect the old bat signal. Everyone on the ground asks what they're doing. Stealing a floodlight? As the bat signal is secured, Peacekeeper 6 races to the top telling everyone to freeze, but instead of retreating, Phosphorus stands firm telling Astrid that this is his regret. This is something he cannot continue, and thank you for believing in a moral wretch. She calls out to him, but Peacekeeper 6 takes her shot. Astrid screams as she jumps off the escape helicopter, driving her sword right through Peacekeeper 6's chest. Phosphorus says that she keeps saying that there's a new day dawning, but he doesn't want to see the dawn. When the sun rises, it hurts his skin. And Astrid tells Two-Face to throw her a line. She's not leaving him behind. Whatever is possible for their medical team to do for him, they will do it. So later, as Astrid gathers everyone to the roof of Wayne Manor, she tells all of those listening that there will be no more power brokers or politicians. No more mercenaries to come and beat their people into submission. They are a broken and insane collective dreg of humankind, yet they have proven to be a common cure for the wasteland of Gotham City. And for what? Broken trinket? A relic of Gotham's former glory? Did their brother fall in battle to help recover a simple floodlight? No. This light is a beacon of hope that reminds the Magistrate why the relics of Gotham are worth fighting for. It is a symbol, more valuable than any coin. It is their light in the darkness, a signal for those in peril upon the sea of fate. It is their sun, and from today, the bat signal will always shine in Gotham. The guard leads the prisoner through the Magistrate detention facility, remarking how she doesn't look like much. The prisoners all crowd around the windows of their cells, calling out to her, and the guard smiles as they reach her cell, commenting on how there's nothing on her in the system. No record of your prints, nothing on facial recognition software, no DNA, no nothing, same as your new roommate. He comments, pushing her to the floor, telling her that if she talks, he can get her transferred tomorrow. You don't, there's plenty of people here who would love to see you again, he tells her. He picks her up, ordering her to give him the resistance. But Cassandra Kane stares him down. Of all the people I thought I would see getting tossed in here, you're the last. What, nothing to say to your old friend? Stephanie Brown asks as Cassandra turns to look at her. She moves fast, her fists lashing out in a blur, cracking Stephanie across the jaw. She barely blinks. I've been friends in low places, and they won't take kindly to you getting fresh with me, Stephanie tells her. She snorts, reminding Cass that she's a traitor to Nightwing's cause, but she shakes her head, reminding Cass that the government sees them all as masks. Cassandra looks around the room, figuring out all the angles, and Stephanie leans against her bunk, informing Kane of the floors and ceilings that have been wired for sound. If she wants privacy, she needs to get her hands on one of the two nullifiers that are floating around the prison. She sits back on her bed, flipping through her book. There are some folks who can be real friendly, and wouldn't mind being a go-between for the right price. She remarks offhandedly. Cass whirls at her. I suppose it would be too much to expect, spoiler, that someone who has sunk so low would do the right thing. Cass snaps at her. And Stephanie just smiles. Ask me for help and find out, she says. But Cass doesn't believe that she wouldn't betray her. You tell me how you got caught, and I'll see about that nullifier, Spoiler says as she stands again. But Cass refuses, turning away from Spoiler, smiling. Missed you too, babe. The next day, Cass moves through the prison population. She talks to the Resistance members, asking if they know where her contact, Odysseus, is. Most believe that he is dead, but Jimmy Olsen points her to whatever is beneath the solitary area, and she'll have to find a way there. By the third day, Cassandra is picking fights with the other prisoners, but no matter how hard she tries, no one will fight back. She gets to Jason Blood, grabbing him by the shirt. She knew you'd try this, you know. She's made us swear not to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with you. He tells her, and Cass asks why. You have to ask her. 
He tells her with a shrug. She finds Spoiler in the laundry room with Zaz. She orders the villains to leave and Stephanie nods in agreement. You wanted my attention and you're gonna regret getting it. It's for your own good, I promise, Stephanie shouts as she takes a swing that is easily blocked. The two trade blows back and forth, blocking each other easily. What's more important, your mission or a tussling with me? Stephanie asks, and Cassandra whirls, slamming several blows into the woman's kidneys. I can multitask, she hisses. So Stephanie turns, clotheslining Cassandra hard. All right, enough of that, she snaps. But Cass gets back up and the two continue to battle. As they trade blows, Stephanie manages to twist and slip the nullifier into Cassandra's jumpsuit. The fight continues until both women are electrocuted and on the floor. And the captain stands over them. Maybe a stay in the solitary confinement will remind you both of your manners, he tells them. And over in her cell, Cass reaches for the tray of food that the guard leaves for her. In the middle of the plate sits a Bluetooth radio earbud. She picks it up, hearing Stephanie's voice. Miss me, gorgeous? How did you manage this? Cass asks. I've made friends in high places too. Cass's eyes go wide as Stephanie begins to quote the Odyssey, revealing that she is the contact within the prison. She is Odysseus. Yeah, surprise, we've been on the same side all along, she says sadly. Cass is shocked as Spoiler explains that she helped her get into solitary confinement and slipped the nullifier into her pocket. It's been a long year. She tells her. Her eyes glisten with tears, and she explains that after Barbara went missing and Batman died, she went to Nightwing and asked to work with some of the villains to fight against the Magistrate, but Nightwing refused, telling her that it would undermine the resistance, but offered to let her get her hands dirty if she would do it on the other side. All this time, all these lies, Cassandra whispers, and Stephanie nods, looking at her hands. It's okay, I wouldn't forgive me either, but I want to help if I can. If you can bring yourself to trust me enough, Spoiler tells her. Cassandra explains that the Resistance received a message from inside the prison. The Bat was alive. Cassandra tells Stephanie that if Batman is alive in the prison, they have to find him. Spoiler nods as she stands. Once a Bat girl, always a Bat girl, she says with determination. But meanwhile, a couple of cells below them, the lights flash red all around a woman. And strapped to a machine, Barbara Gordon's eyes glow. Cassandra makes her way through the halls, smiling as she hacks the security door with her subdermal implant. In the main hall, the riot has been going on for two minutes. Knock them out! Don't take them out! We need them breathing if we hope to get out of here! Stephanie Brown reminds the collection of super villains that she is fighting alongside. They continue their battle, but suddenly all of the prisoners' wrist guards activate and they fall to the ground in pain. Not your smartest move, Blondie! The captain of the guard laughs as he enters the room. Hurry up! Stephanie gasps over the radio to Cassandra. Batgirl moves quickly through the prison, knocking out a guard and taking his armor. She rounds the corner to find another guard in front of a door. Captain wants you in the mess, she tells him. All right, coming, he nervously says as he runs off. And in the mess hall, Stephanie hisses to Cassandra that she's on her own right before the captain kicks her in the chin. But Cassandra comes over the radio. Not yet, Batgirl, she tells her friend. And suddenly all the wrist locks fall off the prisoners. Stephanie smiles as she and the others stand up, no longer held down by this. Looks like the animals got loose, Captain, she says as she cracks her knuckles. The prisoners and the guards launch themselves once more into combat. Hope you're close to being clear, Cass. I don't know how much more we've got left. Stephanie shouts over the radio, and inside of the control room, Cass finds what she is looking for, moving off into the shadows. She hacks her way through another door, looking down at who she finds, shock filling her eyes. It's you, Barbara. What did they do to you? She gasps as she sees Barbara is strapped to the table with tubes and wires sticking out of her. She rips Barbara free, trying to tell the woman that they don't have time until the system reboots. You found me. Barbara gasps as she leans in to hug Cassandra, and Batgirl picks her up, carrying Barbara out as she explains that the Magistrate links her into their connection, trying to pull all of the information that she had. She had some control, though, enough to send the message to the Resistance. I know they're hiding something. Something big. I need access to a computer, Barbara whispers, and Cassandra nods, getting on the comms to Stephanie. She asks if she can hold the guards off a little bit longer, but she isn't getting an answer. She looks at Barbara. This might be our only chance of getting out. Cass reminds her, and Barbara shakes her head, reminding Cass that people are never a means to an end. Cass pulls out an orb, activating it and appearing in her Batgirl uniform. They turn, seeing a group of guards heading towards them. Cass is amongst them in seconds, kicking and flipping her way through them with lightning speed, and she looks back to see two of the guards attacking Barbara. She finds strength beating them down. 
Once a bad girl, always a bad girl, the two women smile, and they head back into the central control room with Cass radioing to Nightwing as Barbara goes to work on the magistrate systems. Nightwing, I have her. It wasn't him. I found Oracle. Cassandra tells their leader. Then there's a pause before Nightwing orders Cassandra to bring Barbara home. Suddenly, the redhead gasps. I think I found Batman, or at least a bread trail to him, she says, and Cass nods, explaining to Nightwing that they have a complication with the others in the prison. Boyle knew the risks. You have your mission, please. Bring Oracle home. Nightwing tells her again. Enough talking about me like I'm not here tonight, Nightwing, Barbara says into the comms, and she reminds Nightwing that they never leave anyone behind. Meanwhile, over in the mess hall, Spoiler and Poison Ivy fall to their feet. Why didn't you go with her? Ivy asks. Never abandon your people. I'm not one of them anymore, but old habits die hard. Been a pleasure fighting by your side, Stephanie tells her. And as the captain steps forward, an alarm begins to sound in the prison, and he looks up in fear, demanding to know what is happening. Stephanie smiles. What did I say? We never leave our people behind, she tells him. Suddenly, all the screens go black, and a display of an image of Oracle's head appears. The drones hover nearby, projecting an image of the Oracle on every surface, and throughout the city, everyone's phones and screens also show the Oracle image. And she tells the people of Gotham, both the magistrate and the civilians alike, that the masks have failed them. But she tells them that there is still hope. We are the resistance. Join our cause. As long as we live, there is always hope. We know what we have to do now. We have to fight for what is right, the words echoing throughout the city. Inside of the prison, the resistance has arrived. Nightwing, Batwoman, Talia Al Ghul, and Robin joined the battle. The prisoners are freed soon, and the guards rounded up and imprisoned. And later, at base two of the resistance, Barbara looks up at Dick, reminding him that his hovering is making her tired. She thanks him for finding her, and the two embrace, and they kiss. They have much to do, but it can wait a few more minutes. Outside, Cassandra finds Stephanie, and Spoiler asks what is to happen to all of the villains in the prison. But Cassandra tells her that there are no more heroes, there are no more villains, only the Resistance. I know this doesn't make things square, but thanks for giving me a chance when you didn't have a reason to, Stephanie tells her. And Cass apologizes for not trusting Stephanie more. I believe in you, Stephanie Brown, Batgirl. I hope you give me a chance to heal what's been damaged. The two embrace on the wall, looking down at the resistance below them. To new beginnings, and to keeping the faith. Cash glances casually at the gun to his head. It isn't as bad as it looks. This means you fold? Cash asks. But the man doesn't waver. He knows that Cash has something up his sleeve. He knows that he's been cheating. But Cash moves fast, yanking the man's arm and pulling the pistol from his hand. Out of his sleeve, he pulls out a knife, pinning the guy's hand to the table. The guy screams as Cash pulls the knife back and picks up the heavy pistol. Don't accuse someone of cheating unless you're really sure you can take him in a fight, moron. Cash snaps, throwing the pistol back on the table, aware that everyone is staring at him. Don't act like you've never seen anyone get stabbed before, Cash says simply. A call from behind gets his attention as the GCPD officers ask, If they can, uh... Have a word. Guns not mine, Cash says as he picks up his money. We know who you are, Cole Cash, the female officer states, and the entire bar suddenly stops and stares. The thugs and goons all begin to move forward. They've all been slighted by Cole Cash in some way or another. Everyone calm down, I can explain, Cole says as his hand curls around a bottle of beer. He spins quickly, cracking the bottle over the head of the nearest goon. Then he flips and rolls as the bar turns into a massive fight. He moves fast, his feet and fists striking out against anyone that gets close. A kick taking him in the back, and he stumbles to the door, landing outside. Not ideal, but I'll take any exit I can get, he thinks to himself as he falls to the ground. He looks up and he's greeted by dozens of cops and their combat drones but he doesn't hesitate. He makes a break for it across the street, but a car hits him and he cracks onto the windshield. Ow, I'm, oh, I'm okay. He gasps as the cops surround him again. Quickly, Cash is loaded into the back of the police van, his cuffs magnetized to the roof. He looks up to see a man in a suit sitting across from him. Cole, is that you? Luke Fox asks. No, sorry, Cole says with a shake of his head. Cole avoids Luke's questions, but doesn't seem overly surprised to find one of Gotham's favorite sons in the back of a magistrate van. They're finishing up the roundups. So all the masks and capes are targets. Luke explains, even though Cole didn't ask. He tries to explain that he's out of the game and he doesn't associate with anyone. But Luke smiles. Batwing hasn't flown in years either. You have to get me out of here. Luke finally whispers as the van continues to speed through the city. Get yourself out of here. 
Cole grumbles. And he looks up telling Luke that they're people who can get him out of Gotham if he has the money. Yeah, who? Luke questions. If I knew that, you think I'd still be in the city? Cole snaps. They continue to argue, but finally Cole lashes out, kicking Luke hard in the face. Fox slumps in his cuffs as Cole begins to kick on the wall of the cab. Hey, guard! This guy started puking blood and passed out! Cole shouts, and the door slides open and the guard orders Cole to stay in his seat. He checks the unconscious Fox before calling for backup with his buddy. Steve, this guy's messed up. How far out? The guard begins to call, but he's interrupted as Cole wraps his legs around the guy's throat and begins to choke him from behind. Luke, grab his gun! Cole shouts, but Luke doesn't move, and the guard pulls his own pistol trying to shoot Cash. Luke, stop playing! Fine, I'll do it myself! Cole yells as he kicks the guard's gun and the rounds chew through the front of the van. The van screeches through the traffic, slamming into the cars until it finally flips over. The driver struggles to the back of the van, pulling out his pistol, ordering Cole to get on his knees, and finally, Luke sits up, aiming a pistol at the guard. Drop it. The guard does as he's told, and Luke begins to yell at Cole for his insane plan. You made me use a gun. I hate guns. Luke shouts. You didn't use it. You pointed it at someone. Cole reminds him as he takes the pistol and shoots the guard in the leg. That's using it, Cole explains. Fox tries to yell at him, but Cash quickly explains that the guard was going for his gun and now he'll get a month's paid leave. Cole grabs another pistol and the two exit the van. Luke tries to convince Cole to get him out of the city, finally offering him $50,000. Cole curses as he throws his cigarette aside. And a short time later, Cole unlocks his apartment and leads Luke inside. Get comfy, because we're not going anywhere until I get two things. Cole tells him. He gets the first when he pulls one of his pistols out of a duffel bag. He pulls out a large rifle as well, aiming it at Luke's head. And the truth is the other, Cole tells him. Luke holds up his hands, re-explaining that the magistrate grabbed him because he used to be Batwing. He can't call his family because he doesn't want his father to know what he did. He pulls a credit card out of his pocket, explaining that it has access to an untraceable $50,000. And now it's yours, Luke tells Cole. Finally believing Luke Fox, Cole begins to pull out other gear from his bags. He hands Luke a mask with no eye holes, explaining that his contact has some trust issues. What about you? Luke asks as Cole begins to pull on his own mask. Oh, I got my own. And when he turns around, we see that Cole Cash is Grifter. They move through the city streets quickly, with Grifter telling Luke not to be suspicious. I have a sack on my head and you're wearing a goddamn bandana over your face. Luke points out. This is the Narrows, man. It's not suspicious here. Cole tells him as they duck into an alleyway. Well, 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 if it isn't the grifter himself. The woman sits on top of the fence, looking down at the pair as her thugs begin to surround them. You screwed us, grifter! She accuses him, but Cole shakes his head. Veil, vale, I would never screw the Black Mass Syndicate, he tells her. And she points out that he did. Intentionally, I would never do it intentionally. In fact, I was just coming to find you. He explains as Luke pulls off his mask and they go back to back. He looks at Luke. Why don't you tell them why we're here? Yeah, he has $50,000 for you to cover what happened. Grifter glares at him. That's your line? He hisses. What was I supposed to say? Make something up! Grifter snaps, and he lashes out, punching the nearest black mask goon, telling Luke to run. They keep running, rounding the corner as Cash can turn and open fire on the advancing gang members. They round another corner and dive behind a bomb. Cole throws a grenade, trying to get the gang to back off, but they seem to be better equipped than the last members. And finally, they duck inside of an abandoned bakery. I think we lost him, Cole says with a sigh of relief. That's great, but where the hell are we? Luke asks as he looks around the kitchen. Cole pulls off his mask, commenting that he still got it since they arrived where they needed to go. We're in the home of one of the last and best criminals that this city has ever produced. The queen of clubs herself, Cole says as he pulls a card from his sleeve that depicts the Huntress. He leans down, lighting a cigarette. You might want to throw that hood back on. The Huntress isn't someone that you want mad at you. And in the shadows of the room, Huntress aims her crossbow. As the boot of the Huntress kicks firmly into the face of Grifter, Grifter thinks to himself that he's going to have to finish this job and get Luke out of here. But he's getting the notion that Huntress might still be mad at him. Luke tells her to hang on a second, but Huntress turns back, pointing her crossbow at him. Grifter gets up telling him that it's cool. He just came here to talk, and as Huntress attacks him again, she says that this is them talking. After another dodge, Grifter swings back, punching Huntress. And after quickly realizing what he just did, he simply says, Crap. That was instinct! Luke rushes back to try and break up the fight, yelling, Whoa, 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 whoa! My name is Luke Fox, and I need your help. Huntress asks how do they know that he isn't a cop, and Luke holds up a card stating that the cops don't pay. 
Hunter takes the card and Luke goes on telling her that it should be more than enough, untraceable. He needs to get out of Gotham. She scans the card and after a few moments pass, she tells him, okay, 75,000 transferred into my account. Let's get you out of Gotham. Grifter asks, why do you get more? But before Luke can answer, Huntress tells him, shut up, there's someone. At that moment, a smoke grenade is thrown into the warehouse and a cyber comes crashing through the door as a dozen magistrate officers storm in. One of the officers sees Huntress standing up on a ledge and as they grab and spin her around, they see that it's a mannequin holding a bomb. As the building explodes, Huntress races off with Grifter and Luke on her bike, and Grifter says that sitting back here is really emasculated. But before they could get very far, the Magistrate starts to rain bullets down, and Grifter says that he told her that they weren't cops. And Huntress asks, Do you really think that the Magistrate wouldn't shoot their own to get to me? The Grifter starts to shoot back at the drones following, but as Huntress turns a corner, Grifter notices some flammable barrels right next to them. The Magistrate begins to close in, and Grifter fires a shot into the barrels, causing a massive explosion, halting the drones. A few moments later, Huntress speeds into another one of her safe houses, stating that this is where they need to be. Now wait. Grifter asks what are they waiting for, and just at that moment, several laser sights focus on him, and he's suddenly shocked. Vail walks up asking if he remembers her. Thanks for ripping off her crew. Huntress tells her that her business is the other one. Get them to the docks. Grifter's yours. Vale says that Grifter is already hers. She's not helping them. Huntress asks if they're going to have a problem, and Grifter holds up his 50,000 card and says, I can pay you back. Do it with interest. A short while later in the Gotham sewers, Grifter and Luke look over the water, and Luke says that this is it, huh? We just sail out of Gotham now? Grifter says that if they're going to go out across the water, they'd get blown up. Huntress has a way to avoid that mess. So Luke begins to tell him that when they get out of here, he needs him too. But before he could finish, bright lights flash and Vale says that they're here. Make sure to set a secure perimeter so that no one goes near the rich boy. Grifter helps Luke over, asking, what was that? And Luke says that it's not important. A few moments later, a high-tech sub emerges from the water, and Hunter says that this has a remote beacon that is undetectable by the Magistrate and the Peacekeepers. It'll be going about 30 knots, so he'll be home in bed before the night's over. Luke looks at the sub, stating that his father made this, didn't he? And Huntress tells him, yep, make sure to thank Lucius for me. Just then, there's an explosion, and the Magistrate begin to swarm the area, and Huntress tells Luke that he's a traitor. And Luke tells her, I'm sorry, truly. Grifter looks over asking, wait, you sold us out? And Luke says, it's nothing personal, it's just a job. You of all people should understand that. But you were never the target, you were just a means to the end. Luke kicks Grifter back and says, this is a gift to you. Get in this sub and leave Gotham and never come back, Grifter. And Grifter asks, what are you going to tell them? And Luke tells him that they got the Queen of Clubs, that's all anyone cares about. Grifter smacks his hand away, jumping over the ledge into the sub. The controls tell him that he must press three launch buttons to begin. He stares for a moment at his hand as it hovers over the button and then he stops. Outside, Peacekeeper 08 stands over Huntress, telling her that it's over. So Grifter jumps in, spraying the area with bullets, stating, It's not over yet! But Peacekeeper 08 grabs him by the leg, throwing him beside Huntress. Huntress says that they can't beat him. And Grifter says, Yeah, I'm starting to get that feeling. Peacekeeper 08 jumps into the air, but from throwing Grifter, his ammo belt came loose. So Grifter shoots the grenades on the belt, detonating it and casing 08 in flames. Grifter hands Huntress his card, stating, This is my money. And before you ask, yes, I gave Vale an empty one. Huntress then asks, Why is he giving her this? And Grifter knocks her out and sets her in the sub, telling her that he's trying to be less of a, well, you know. Huntress mutters that he is stupid, but Grifter jumps out telling her, I'm gonna buy you some cover. Good luck, go help more people. Zero Eight stands up from the fire, disfigured, stating, it's over, you lost. Grifter watches the sub leave and Luke shouts that they're letting him go in exchange for her. What the hell were you thinking? You could have walked out of here free. This is how the debt is repaid? You're going to Blackgate for a long damn time, Grifter. And as Grifter listens to Luke shout, he sits back and smiles. Gotham glows in the distance as a shadow moves across the rooftop. Magistrate Radio Chatter warns that they have incoming, and in the alleyway, the man screams as he tries to protect his wife. But the Magistrate Robotic Soldiers aren't listening. 
One reaches down, ignoring the man's protests as he grabs him around the neck, when suddenly Nightwing descends from above, kicking the robot in the head, twirling and smashing it with his escrima stick. The others move to stop him, a drone at its back, but Nightwing flips, tossing his stick, smashing both of them. And as Nightwing retrieves the weapons, the man thanks him, offering his hand. The Nightwing twirls again, throwing the stick, cracking the man in the jaw. No, your body language is all wrong. You're not scared. You're ready to pounce. I thought the magistrate was going automated. I guess certain cases still require the human touch. Nightwing growls at the man. He struggles to his feet, his hands glowing as he explains that he is augmented. He rushes Nightwing, who easily dodges and knocks him out with a kick. You're no threat, though. Your wife, though? What tricks does she have up her sleeve? Nightwing asks, turning to the woman. She smiles, pulling out twin knives, which Nightwing dodges. But the echo of a gunshot fills the alleyway and a round hits his shoulder armor. He stumbles, but manages to take out the woman and drop a smoke pellet. The magistrate sniper continues to look down from his vantage point, but he can't see anything due to the smoke. I can't see a damn thing, and it's Nightwing, so he's right behind me, he whispers over the radio. He turns to draw his pistol, but Nightwing stops with a hard boot. He leans in, questioning the soldier about how many more special teams the magistrate has looking for him. And not getting any answers, Nightwing begins to walk away. So it's true, you're darker than you used to be. I think someone's overcompensating for Bat Daddy, the sniper calls. Nightwing turns, shattering the man's knee with a well-placed scrim stick. Enjoy the rest of your evening, he calls as he leaps into the night air. And as he rolls in pain, that sniper manages to call to the base. Mission's accomplished, he gasps. In the Magistrate Headquarters, located deep inside of the old GCPD precinct, Peacekeeper 01 sits at his desk, continuing to scroll through his camera feeds. His door opens up and Captain Marks walks in with a look of triumph, and she tells 01 that they have Nightwing hooked. 01 isn't so sure. He looks down at Gotham City. The Magistrate is trying to end the mass threat, and they've all been relatively successful except for Nightwing and his group of terrorists. I wonder if Nightwing still believes that we killed his unkillable mentor. He muses. And finally, Marks leaves and Zero One reminds her that victory is mandatory. Elsewhere in the city, Nightwing walks through the old ruins of Arkham Asylum. The building is destroyed around him, but he continues forward, finally stepping through a hologram and into his secret lair. A short time later, he speaks with his network of operatives, explaining that their actions have forced a response from the Magistrate. Prepare yourselves. Things have been tough. They will be tough, but so are we. We're his legacy, and we will fight until it's over. Until we win, just like he would have, he reminds them. Batgirl nods on the screen, telling Dick about the reports of the new Batman running around. He nods, telling her that he'll look into it personally, and he signs out, moving away to hit the shadows. But as the hot water runs over his sore muscles, his eyes open. Someone's there. He turns the corner, quickly locked into combat with the new Batman. Batman moves fast, throwing Dick to the ground. People call me Batman, the Dark Knight tells Dick, and Grayson just smiles at him. Hello, Batman. Arkham, welcome guest. Maximum voltage, he says simply, and the shock rips through the new Batman, knocking him out, forcing him to the ground. When he awakens, he's strapped to a chair. He questions whether Nightwing looked under his mask while he was out, but Dick shakes his head, confirming that he was the same Batman running around the city, but he didn't look. I value privacy, unlike some people, Nightwing notes. And finally, he looks at him. Why are you here? He demands, and Batman looks at him. Because of a case, Sarah Dowell. Batman explains that Sarah was 10 years old and has been kidnapped. I rescued her and hurt the people that needed to be hurt, but after I returned her safely to her parents, the Magistrate Cybers took her. They took her to interrogate her about me. And Sarah's dead, I know it, killed by the monsters for nothing. The Magistrate is too many, too cruel to fight alone. I need to be a part of your resistance, I can help, Batman tells him. The conversation is then interrupted by Nightwing's computer beeping to let him know that the others have arrived. Batman joins him at the computer, removing the cuffs from his hand as they both acknowledge the large group of Magistrate Special Forces gathering outside of the asylum. Well done. You're earlier than I expected, Nightwing notes without looking at Batman. He explains that the Magistrate shot him with a nano bullet that was easily tracked. The Magistrate bugged you, tracked you here, do you let them? Why? Batman asks. Nightwing turns, gritting his teeth. Because this way, I have the home advantage. Because I'm done. It's time to make a statement. I'm going to war. Outside, the news reporter turns to Peacekeeper 06, interviewing her before the Peacekeepers begin their assault on the secret fortress of Nightwing. How do your brave troops plan on taking down such a dangerous criminal? The reporter asks. 
with the only method that works for his kind. Without mercy! She nods at the camera. Inside the ruins of Arkham, Nightwing and the new Batman stare at the screens. This isn't being broadcast right now, the new Batman notes, and Nightwing nods, explaining that later it'll be presented as a live. Nothing like having your own fascist TV network to get the propaganda out there. Batman nods, and Nightwing continues to work on the computer, telling Batman that if the Peacekeepers can break in here, their victory will be totaled. Let's start the culling, Nightwing says as he hits a button. The EMP pulse works out of the center of Arkham, hitting the Peacekeeper forces hard, their vehicles all shutting down, and all of the drones shorting out and hitting the ground. What was that? The reporter shouts as he kicks his useless camera drone. An EMP blast. The Peacekeeper tells him. Inside, Nightwing moves to his weapons locker as he explains the EMP to Batman, telling the new hero that the blackout will give them enough time to slip away. But Batman grabs Nightwing as he's gearing up. Are you trying to protect me? I chose this life! He snaps, but Nightwing shakes his head and he explains that his plan's risk versus reward ratio is tight. If I don't live to see another day, Gotham should at least have one of us. It needs Batman, Nightwing tells him. But Batman shakes his head, reminding Dick that Batman is the one who decides who needs help. Right now, that's you, Batman explains, and Nightwing stares at him for a moment as he finishes gearing up. Well, dynamic duo it is then. The first group of soldiers make their way into the ruins of Arkham, but the duo descend from the ceiling. The two are amongst them in seconds, disarming and knocking the soldiers out before they have time to react. Not bad. There's room for improvement. Always. Nightwing grabs one of the soldiers, demanding to know what his orders were. Shoot to kill! Under any circumstances! The soldier stammers, but Nightwing smiles slightly at the soldier's words. Batman looks at Nightwing, questioning the unnecessary questions. I have my reasons. Nightwing tells him, and suddenly a gunshot fills the room with Nightwing pushing Batman out of the path of a bullet. The two leap back into action, attacking the second squad as they break through the doors, and outside a soldier reports the loss of two squads to Peacekeeper 06. Takes a line in the back, she asks, and the soldier nods and 06 orders him to fire at the building. But her soldiers are still inside. He begins to argue, but 06 leans in, telling him, nothing trumps taking out the masked scum. The tanks open fire, destroying the building, and it all begins to burn. The Great Inferno raising up into the night sky. Doesn't that look beautiful? Zero Six notes with a smile, unaware that the nearby invisible drones are behind her. The soldiers report that the cybers are back online, and Zero Six begins to order them to head inside to collect bodies. But suddenly she is slashed across the cheek by a battering. Please don't. Oracle tells her, and Zero Six sees the masked members of the Resistance standing before her. The heroes leaping into the fight, attacking the group of soldiers. Inside of his base, Nightwing pulls himself out of the rubble, looking up at one of his working screens, and sees the heroes fighting against the soldiers. No! What are they doing? He snaps, and Batman pulls himself free, telling Nightwing, I called the others. That was not your decision to make! Nightwing snaps at him, but Batman looks at him, reminding him that the city needs Batman just as much as it needs the other heroes. Like Nightwing. We're leaving now. Dick pauses for a moment. Help me up, he finally says, and outside the battle is continuing, until finally Oracle turns to her comrades. The rescue mission is almost over, people. The growly, bat-esque voice in my ear tells me it's time to move out. But Zero Six stands in her way, telling Oracle that she is going to flay her skin from her bones and make a coat. Barbara just smiles at her, reminding her that trying to kill the leader of the Resistance is a great motivator. Do you mind if he uh, joins us? Barbara asks, and the sound of a revving engine fills the night air as a secret door opens up from the ground. Now, I'm more of a motorbike person, but he's dying to show you his new car. Oracle tells her, and the muscle car flies out of the secret garage, slamming into several cybers and knocking them to the ground. As the car screeches away, Zero Six begins to curse, turning and realizing that the other members of the Resistance have also vanished. The reporter begins to shout at her, demanding to know what he should show the people. And Zero Six hand snaps out, grabbing the man by the throat, snapping his neck with one quick motion. She turns to one of the soldiers, demanding him to get her a car that is running. Meanwhile, Batman and Nightwing are speeding through the streets of Gotham, screeching around the corners with Batman apologizing for calling in the resistance. If they lost their leader, after already losing, he begins, but Nightwing finishes the sentence. It would have been bad. You did the right thing. But the car is then T-Bowed, sending it rolling into a construction site. Nightwing groans as he pulls himself out of the wreckage. Be still, my mechanical beating heart. Look at the killer pair that I've drawn. I had no idea that you were working together. This almost makes up for the rest of the night. Zero Six calls out as she heads down the hill into the construction site. As they prepare themselves, Nightwing offers Batman one last piece of advice. 
Watch her arms. They punch really hard. He shouts, Zero Six rushing them. She lashes out, denting the car with her robotic punches. But as Batman leaps away, she snags him by the foot, throwing him to the ground. She goes in to punch Batman in the face, but Nightwing throws his a scrimmage stick, shocking her. Nightwing knows who she is. He knows that her identity was erased by the peacekeepers. He knows that her parents were murdered in front of her by the Joker. I know what it's like to see your family destroyed, to lose the people that love you most. We're not the villains you want us to be, Elizabeth. You're all scum! Scum that needs to be cleansed from our lives! Just like we did with Batman. She shouts at him, rushing at him, but Nightwing connects with his electric escrima sticks. He dodges her blow, shocking her spine as he twirls through the air. Zero Six grunts in pain, but twirls and brings her elbow into Nightwing's face. But Batman is there, knocking her away, slamming her into a pile of debris, which falls, trapping her. She looks up at the heroes, weakened by the electrical attacks. Going to take my life now? Vengeance for your bat that I helped kill? Do it! I'll just be replaced tomorrow! The Magistrate will win! She gasps one last time, but Nightwing shakes his head. He's not going to take her life. He's going to take the Magistrate's reputation. He reveals his crew as cloaked drones. Drones that have filmed everything that happened tonight. Every terrible thing that you and your soldiers have said or done and everything that you've lost. Raw, unedited, unspinnable failure, he tells her. And he and the new Batman turn to leave. I'll send you an invitation to the premiere, he calls out over his shoulder. The two heroes pull themselves out of the construction site, looking at the dawn that has begun to stream over the horizon. Look at that. Morning. Another day. Nightwing says as he throws an arm around his new partner. Outside of Gotham, Katana roars through the sky with her jetpack as lightning cracks through the sky behind her. Inside Gotham, Duke Thomas grits his teeth, jamming hard on the gas pedal as the peacekeepers continue to shoot at the back of his muscle car as he roars down the bridge towards the Gotham City line. The passengers in his car scream in panic, but Duke tells them to trust him to get them out of Gotham and continue on. With a roar of his powerful engine, the muscle car shoots over the barriers that the peacekeepers have put up, and Duke screeches to a stop outside of the city. Two of the peacekeepers rush forward, their weapons at the ready. Stand down! Stand down, agents! We have no jurisdiction! Their commanding officer shouts, and the soldiers ignore those orders, continuing forward until Katana lands right in front of them. Any part of you crosses that line, your soul is mine! She warns them, cutting a line in the pavement. The soldiers pause for a moment before raising their rifles and opening fire. In a blur of steel, Katana blocks every round, finally deflecting one of the bullets back at the soldiers, hitting him in the chest. She moves fast, knocking the man back across the line, and his partner begins to drag him back towards the barricades. We're gonna catch him, you know, and then we're gonna put him on trial and deal with him. The soldier yells, wow. The refugees gasp as they look at Katana. I know, right? Welcome to the outside, Duke tells the group with a smile. Walking over to his friend and former teammate, thanking her for the assist, but Katana turns on him, anger in her voice. She points at Duke, reminding him that he needs to decide which side of Gotham he is planning on staying on. But he shakes his head, telling her that the Magistrate has them all marked, and they are threatening their families. But Katana is barely listening. She reminds him that none of them are safe, and that he cost her valuable time. Take them and go! She tells him as she blasts off with her jetpack. She flies through the air, pointing towards the warehouse, lightning crackling as she can hear her husband's voice in the sword. She nods, telling him that she'll apologize to Duke later, and as they near the warehouse, Katana's jetpack begins to cough and sputter. She used valuable fuel to save Duke and his refugees. She begins to cut the engines, trying to skip and lower her descent to the warehouse's roof, where she lands with a hard crash, the jetpack smoldering it in flames. I'm fairly certain that someone heard that. I love you and yes, I'll be careful, she tells her husband as she unsheaths her sword. She kicks open the door hard and the peacekeepers are on her in a second as she cuts her way through them. It's a running battle as she moves through the hallways and rooms of the warehouse. She leaps, flips, and slices her way through the magistrate forces. Every room she leaves is decorated with the corpses of her enemies. Until finally she reaches the lab and it is there that she meets an old traitor. Caliber, betrayer, what are you doing here? She demands. Caliber smiles, informing her that he is working with the Magistrate on some advanced tech. Let me show you, he says with a smile, and he hits her with a powerful blast, sending her through the wall and outside once more. Caliber steps outside, ordering the van that was about to leave to take off. You understand how bad this night can get for you, right? Caliber asks with a nod, but Katana ignores him, rushing after the van, while reminding her husband that Caliber doesn't frighten her at all. Hey! 
You know it's just me here. Have you completely lost it, Tatsu? He asks as he tries to attack her. But she ducks under his attack and rolls forward, the katana cutting through the side of the van like butter, destroying the tire and engine. As the van flips and rolls, Katana meets Caliber in battle as he blocks her sword strikes with his robotic arm, knocking her back hard. She blocks again and again while he hammers on her with punches until finally she drops to her knee, exhausted. Ha! <laughs> I just remembered! You're talking to your husband, right? His soul is trapped in the magical sword. Caliber says that he stands over her. He smiles grimly, telling her that the magistrate will melt the sword down into scrap and they can be together again. But Katana smiles. No, husband. I don't think he has any idea, she tells him as she flips into the air at lightning speeds. Bringing the sword down onto Caliber's robotic arm, she flips, dodging another of his attacks when suddenly a bullet grazes her leg. She turns and more peacekeepers have arrived, so Caliber reaches for the sword, trying to pull it free of his arm as Katana dodges under his blows. He manages to clip Katana in the chin. Standing over her, he prepares to give the killing blow. Why is that lightning black? One of the peacekeepers asks as they look up into the stormy sky. The lightning suddenly seems to take a human shape as it strikes the ground, throwing Caliber away. The Merc looks shocked as he realizes that his systems have begun to short out. And another lightning blast strikes one of the vans and Caliber orders his men to retreat. It ain't over, Tatsu! I'll see you again! Caliber shouts as they drive away. And Katana struggles to her feet, stunned with awe as black lightning appears before her, his body entirely energy. Suddenly he's behind her and she swings her blade, but the lightning races through her body and she falls away. He holds onto her blade, apologizing for the attack. So it's true. You've been cursed. Only black magic could have done this, Katana says, regarding her old friend. That's not important now, Tatsu. The magistrate, they planted someone here with Duke. Jefferson tells her. Katana kneels by her broken sword, the Soul Taker. Black Lightning says that he's wondering if she still had the original. What in the world happened to it? And she doesn't respond to the question, but asks him what happened. Black Lightning looks at himself, stating that it's a really long story. Trying to do the right thing, but everything went wrong. There was some magic involved too and a curse. We'll figure it out after we find Duke. At that moment, there's a flash of light and Black Lightning appears, dropping the current Soul Taker. Katana asks what happened, and soon Black Lightning reappears again, telling her, Sorry, I'm still getting used to all of this. As they get ready to set out, Katana's communicator rings, and Duke asks if she can hear him. Katana shouts, asking if he's okay, and Duke says, For a moment, but something seems a little off. The whole bridge is set up to be a little too easy. Could be just... No, never mind. Tagged the three civilians with nano tracers, and one is already missing. Just then, one of the civilians comes crashing down, narrowly missing Duke, and Duke asks, Couldn't wait, huh? The man kicks, asking if Katana is on the other line. Tell her that her sweet jetpack left a trail that I could see with my robotic eye. As the man attacks again, Duke jumps over, tagging the man with a small device, stating, This isn't going to delete anything. It'll just scramble your internal comms and Wi-Fi antennas. This will give us time to regroup. Back with Katana, she tells Black Lightning that they need to go. Duke needs them. But before leaving, Black Lightning tells her to wait. He holds his hands over the broken sword and suddenly the pieces begin to mend it together as Black Lightning is absorbed. Katana asks what did he do when Black Lightning whispers that she needs to go. A short while later, Katana meets up with Duke to chase the rogue cyborg that Duke was fighting. But before the two of them are able to catch up, the magistrate officers speed up behind. The armored vehicle begins to open up as Caliber is on a mounted gun and it pops out. Caliber then tells the cyborg to get the hell out of there, agent. The gunner opens fire, forcing the two of them to jump off their bikes. Then Katana continues running back with the electrically charged Soul Taker. Black Lightning tells her to hang on, and she cleaves the sword through the armored vehicle with a thundering. But as Katana tries to slow down, she stumbles, dropping the sword. She reaches out, and Caliber takes the sword, bending the blade, telling her, This is goodbye. But as the blade snaps, he is struck with an electrical charge and it electrocutes him. With all of the lightning striking, Black Lightning re-emerges, holding the sword to Caliber's neck. Duke stares, asking how, but Katana asks, Did you manage to wipe the cyborg's memory? Duke tells her, Yeah, but how? Black Lightning says that it was magic, went up against the wrong magician at the wrong time for the right reason. Duke tells him not to worry, they'll fix it. They'll find a way. And later, as Duke's messages continue to be heard all throughout the city, he makes his way to the border. The magistrate officers all point their guns, telling him to stop. Come any closer and they'll shoot. And Black Lightning phases out of the sword as Duke tells them, fine. Shoot then. 
Jason's phone buzzes with a mask alert as he sits up in bed, ignoring the woman laying next to him. He pulls on the Red Hood uniform and heads outside. The bike roars down the street, weaving in and out of traffic on the highway. Vigilante turns, aiming his gun, opening fire at Red Hood. But Jason avoids it. He breaks, pulling out his hook and chain, tossing it at Vigilante. The hook snags on the tire, bringing the bike to a sharp stop, throwing the mask to the ground. And later, Jason throws Vigilante hard onto the magistrate official's desk. Not bad, Hood, the officer says with a smile as he removes the Vigilante's mask. He orders the soldiers to remove the prisoner, and Jason watches as a body bag is wheeled through the room and the officer smiles. Your partner did it again. This would be much easier if these dummies would stop wearing masks, he notes. And another mask alert sounds, and Jason turns to see a screen that shows another Red Hood stealing from a food truck. Wow, would you look at that? Aren't you a little mad these guys are stealing the look that you stole? Red Hood roars through the city on his bike, dismounting at the food truck, ignoring the cops and the civilians as he looks around the scene. A short time later, Hood parks outside of a food bank the line twisting around the block, but he ignores it and heads into the bar across the street. Inside, he ignores the patron's comments and he sits at the bar. Removing his mask, he orders a double, but the thugs aren't leaving. They come up behind Jason, ordering him to put back on his mask and leave. We don't serve heroes in the narrows. One of them hisses as his buddy pulls out a knife. They move to attack him, but a bar stool sails through the air, knocking the one with the knife out, and the two other are taken out in a blur of motion. You didn't wake me when you left this morning. Not even a kiss goodbye. You just wanted a head start. Ravager says with a smile, pulling off the mask, revealing her face. You see, I used the bar stool instead of my swords. She says with a smile as she sits down with Red Hood. And she orders herself a beer. As she drinks, she wonders why he stayed in Gotham after Batman died. Why does he do what he does? And Jason finally stands up. You see that line for the soup kitchen? It's long. Too long. The people in the neighborhood know a shipment of food is coming. He tells her, as he reaches for one of the thugs' phones. He explains that the soup kitchen and the bar were the only places that weren't vandalized. He knows the thugs work for the red hood that stole the food. Ravager smiles as she stands up. Then let's play, she says, and Jason shakes his head. I work alone, he says as he pulls back on his mask. He crosses the street, stepping into the soup kitchen. Everything looks normal inside, so he looks around as he pulls out the phone, hitting the last number called. He can hear the buzzing coming from the back room and he kicks open the door. The fake red hood curses as he drops the boxes that he was carrying, turning and running for the door. They told me I'd be safe, he shouts, and Jason chases him out into the alleyway. But as the fake red hood rounds a corner, he meets Ravager's sword. Looks like dinner's on me tonight, sushi, she asks with a smile as she cleans off her blade. Jason leans down, removing the fake's helmet. The kid was a no one, just someone who was trying to help people, but looking inside, he finds that the helmet was lined with Mad Hatter tech. This has been updated. It's new, he tells her, and he turns away, congratulating her on a good job as he heads back for his bike. Where are you going? She asks him. To find the Mad Hatter and get some answers, Jason tells her, and she straddles the bike. I know where the Mad Hatter's last hideout was. Giddy up, she tells him. So a short time later, the pair are moving through the Wonderland Putt-Putt building, and they round the corner to discover the body of Mad Hatter, long dead. Now who has their hands on the Hatter tech, Rose wonders, when suddenly Jason's phone begins to beep with another mask alert. He glances at it to see that he is the new alert. Crap! Jason curses. Red Hood curses as he looks at the bounty alert on his phone, the alert that's for him. Why is your head worth so much? Ravager asks casually. Red Hood doesn't respond, bending down, looking at the corpse of the Mad Hatter. Every single merc in Gotham is going to be gunning for you now, hun. She continues as she reaches for the sword by her side, but when she turns, Jason is no longer in the room. Oh, foreplay, Ravager whispers with a smile. Red Hood revs his motorcycle as he drives away from the warehouse, getting on the line with the Magistrate Mask Hunter Dispatch, demanding to know why a mask alert was sent out for him. There's a pause on the other end as the dispatch checks. Must be an error in the system. I'll flag it. Why don't you come in? The Magistrate will take care of you, the dispatch tells him. There's another pause and the dispatch tells him to go to the station that he's about to pass. Wait, are you tracking my call? Red Hood asks. The drones open fire, hitting the road around Red Hood, throwing his bike through the air. He lands in a roll and he keeps moving, rounds chewing up the concrete around him. 
He turns, throwing his chain, hooking two of them, and the drones smash together, exploding. Two more buzz in, opening fire, clipping Jason in the shoulder. He takes cover behind a car. The round rips into it, blowing it up. A short time later, Peacekeeper 03 investigates that crime scene. He finds the shattered remains of Red Hood's helmet. Sweep the area for any masks in that damn helmet. The magistrate wants to know who made it tonight. Though wounded, Jason manages to slip into the shadows, pulling himself up a fire escape, finally arriving at the rooftops. Inside, he uses a medkit from his belt, sealing up his wounds, and he sits, breathing heavy as he stares into the lights of Gotham. Ah, I miss this view. He whispers to himself, knowing that he has no choice, and he pulls on the Red Hood helmet with the Hatter tech. Come find me, Rose, he whispers before his mind is taken over. Red Hood moves through the city quickly, finally arriving at the nondescript building. He takes out the guards inside, using an elevator to head below ground. You're late, or are you right on time? The White Rabbit calls out as Jason steps off the elevator. She walks across the room regarding Red Hood. Curious? You're not who I was expecting, she says, before turning to her men, telling them all to pack up their tech. We might be burnt, she explains, and Jason grits his teeth, trying to fight the tech so that he can hit the woman, but his fist stops inches from her face. The white rabbit just smiles, explaining that Jervis wasted his tech, that he refused to work with the powers that be. So I updated it, brought it into the future, and they gave me everything that I wanted, she tells him. But I got bored and decided to help the community. You'd be surprised how many people would put on a mask even if it controls them. She whispers as she hugs Red Hood from behind. Story of my life, Ravager says, as she holds her sword to the back of White Rabbit's neck. I see Jason as a type, she says with a smile. The rabbit demands to know how Ravager found them. And Rose explains that she has precog powers. And I saw me and Red Hood here, which tells me that this is what he wanted. It's cute that he thinks it'll save him, she tells the woman. But the rabbit orders Jason to kill Rose, so he leaps at her, twirling his chain and his knife. Rose blocks the first blow, whirling, kicking him in the back. Jason turns, trying to attack again, but Rose dodges, slashing at his face, breaking the helmet. Jason smiles at her, one eye revealed. Knew you'd find me. He smirks. You're lucky I have a crush on you. She smiles back, and as the guards move in, Jason turns to the white rabbit, demanding to know who she's working for and why they want the helmet. Don't you get it? She says, holding up the piece of the helmet. She tells Jason that they have the same boss. The eyes in the sky don't want any of our plans discovered, she tells him, when suddenly an explosion takes out a wall and the magistrate drones buzz into the room. They open fire immediately and Jason jumps behind a desk. Rose, how do we escape this? What is the future showing you? That you should have kissed me before you left this morning, she shouts as she pulls one of the guards into the path of a bullet. But Jason rushes across the room, tackling Rose out of the exploded wall. He throws his chain, hooking it onto one of the drones, and swings away as the hideout is destroyed. But one of the drones followed him. Before Jason could attack, Rose pulls out her knife, pressing it to his neck. My name is Mask Hunter Ravager, and I'm claiming the bounty on Jason Todd. But I'm bringing him in alive, she shouts. The drones stare at them for a moment before finally turning and flying away. Jason rubs his throat, turning to Rose. Let's go to your dad's secret island. I could use some sun. And with that, they head off. Later, Jason is standing with the Peacekeepers during the cleanup. Peacekeeper 03 apologizes to Jason for a mix-up in the system. All clear now. The magistrate will even offer you hazard pay for your troubles, he explains. Zero Three turns, asking if Jason recovered any of the contraband that White Rabbit was using to control her Red Hood gang. But Jason turns and walks away. Your drones did a number on the place. Nothing was left. He walks over to his recovered bike, and from the shadows of the alleyway nearby, a voice speaks to him. Did you get it? The person asks. Jason tells them that he did. He tells them that he also wants Ravager out of the city. I'll see what I can do, the voice tells him. Jason nods, revving his bike. I bet you will. The sun is out. You better get to bed. He calls as he drives away. Tim Drake looks down as the rain pours around him. Below him, three magistrate guards discuss the really good air packs and their breathing. Robin continues to watch his camo suit, keeping him hidden from those guards. Stop all movement! By order of the magistrate, the cyber shouts as it attacks Robin from behind, able to pick out his heat signature. He leaps away, pulling out an EMP grenade from his belt as cyber gets closer. He throws the grenade, allowing it to detonate against the robot's chest. What? He gasps as the robot doesn't fall and continues to move forward. It reaches through the smoke, wrapping its powerful hands around Robin's throat. 
Heads up! A voice calls out as a powerful blast of energy takes off the robot's head. Tim looks up to see Stephanie standing over him a large laser cannon in her hands. I was in the neighborhood and saw a little bird in trouble, she tells him. Tim's shock at seeing his old friend passes as he kicks the cyber off the ledge, letting it plummet to the alleyway below. They both leap after it and Tim begins to inspect the corpse. I thought you were sticking to the civilian life, Tim asks as he touches the green goo that has begun to leak from the cyber. You're welcome, Robin. It's been a while, Stephanie says as she leans over Tim's shoulder. But Tim looks back at her, pointing out that she was the one who hung up the cape after Bruce was killed. Stephanie just looks at him and Tim changes the subject, letting her know that a shipment is coming that supposedly makes the cybers unbeatable. He holds up his hand and it's covered in a green liquid. This one is using a prototype of the substance. I wanted to see its effects in action. This guy didn't seem so bad. Tim notes, but Stephanie folds her arms, pointing out that the EMP grenade didn't even slow the machine down, telling Robin that he should have kept his camo active. Tim shakes his head, explaining that he couldn't use the shock absorbers and the camo. You can't do everything on your own, Stephanie finally tells him, and Tim nods, asking her to help him stop the convoy before it reaches Gotham. Sorry, Tim, I'm not interested in watching people that I love die. Stephanie tells him with a sad smile, and she pulls on her hood and turns, firing her grappling gun into the air and swinging away. Tim looks down at the sample of green liquid in his hands. If Stephanie won't help him, there's only one person who will. The next day, Tim walks into the Gotham Customs office. He interrupts the jerk that is harassing his friend, holding out a cup of coffee to her with a smile. Darcy stands up, signing a few words and walking away from the stunned, angry jerk. Outside, Darcy explains that she turns her ear module off so that she won't have to listen to people being ignorant. And they switch to sign language due to Tim being afraid of the magistrate eavesdropping. He holds up the sample, asking if she has any idea what it is. Darcy looks afraid as she explains that it's called the Lazarus Resign. She tells him that the liquid is siphoned from the Lazarus pit, and it's rumored to allow synthetics to regenerate. They're bringing the new, more potent batch in tonight. It's supposed to make cybers immortal. She finishes. They've moved now, sitting in Darcy's office, and Tim looks at her, signing that he is going to destroy the new shipment. He asks for her help, explaining that she can help guide him. Show him where to go. And you're going up there with or without me, aren't you? Yeah, there's no way that I'm letting the stupidest genius I know die up there, she tells him. Later that night, Tim and Darcy fly through the air with a jetpack, Robin telling her to prepare to detach on his mark as they draw closer to the convoy ahead. Need a hand? Stephanie calls from the side of the convoy. She reaches out, taking Darcy's hand and helping her on board. Ah, you're a sight for sore eyes, Robin calls, as he reaches out for the ladder. Well, when have I not followed you on a suicide mission? Spoiler jokes. And they slip quietly inside of the convoy shipment, moving amongst the containers, but Darcy suddenly stops them. We have a problem. They're using a communication dampener, which is messing with my ear module, which means, she tells them, as suddenly they're surrounded by magistrate soldiers. Find the resin! We'll be right behind you! Robin shouts as he and Spoiler leap in front of the soldiers. As Darcy runs forward, Robin and Spoiler continue to follow her, fighting the guards as they move. They round the corner to find the container of resin, and a voice suddenly commands them from behind. Halt! It orders. Spoiler, try the cannon! It worked last time! Robin shouts, and Stephanie raises her weapon, firing it into the robot's head. But it keeps coming, not even phased. Robin leaps over the robot's back, attacking the container of resin, allowing it to leak onto the floor. It ends now! You're not hurting my family! Robin shouts, but the cyber moves fast, yanking Robin off of the container, wrapping its hands around his throat. He gasps as it chokes the life out of him, snapping his neck. Turning, it lets his body fall to the ground, dead. The resin continues to leak out, pooling around Tim's body. The resin, it's all over him. Darcy whispers, and suddenly the bones of Tim's body begin to snack back into place and heal. Hell of a round one! Now round two, Tim snarls as he gets up. As the Lazarus resin drips off of Tim's body, he begins to stand up stating, This is not how I planned any of this to go. It wouldn't be easy sneaking into a magistrate convoy, even with spoilers showing up at the last minute to help him and Darcy. He knew it would be a one-way trip. He starts to stand up as his bones snap and twist. Tim just thought that he'd die from this trip and that he would stay dead. With a single punch, Tim knocks the head off of the cyber and Spoiler and Darcy just stare. Tim tells himself as he snaps again. All right, need to focus. I'm not dead. Spoiler and Darcy are counting on me. My whole family is counting on me. I have to destroy the Lazarus resin before it reaches Gotham. 
Don't think about the side effects. Don't think about what the Lazarus Pit did to Jason. Don't think about how it makes him feel so strong. Strong enough to save the whole damn world. More Magistrate soldiers come running in. 30 of them. Any other day, it would have been too much. But right now, he can take them all on with one arm tied behind his back. Is this how Jason feels all the time? Spoiler tells Darcy that there's a change in plans. They have to figure out what happened to Robin. Try and use the Magistrate's systems to find out any information that they can use while she saves the boy wonder. But Tim doesn't need help. Spoiler thinks he needs it, but he doesn't. And for the first time in a long time, oh, he's got this. Spoiler calls out to Tim, but suddenly everything begins to change and Tim sees Two-Face? He and Spoiler were fighting him. They'd normally win, but not now. Two-Face tells him that he isn't strong enough. Too green. No way he'd win. And that a shadowy figure appears stating that Two-Face is right. Soon visions of Nightwing and Damien appear, both telling Tim that he can't save Gotham. If he couldn't save them, how would he save the whole city? He isn't Batman. It's all up to him, and he isn't good enough. He'll never be good enough. Meanwhile, Darcy is frantically searching the computer for information regarding the resin, and all she can find is that it's not compatible with human emotions. Darcy calls out the Spoiler, explaining that the resin is not supposed to be compatible with organic life, and Spoiler asks, all right, what do we do now? Because he's definitely tripping out. Darcy signs that Tim wanted to destroy the resin. That's what they're gonna do. Tim looks back at the two of them talking and a voice asks, why is Spoiler here? She has no interest in watching the ones that she loves dies and yet here she is. The voice screams and it screams and Tim shouts that the plan is to listen to him. They need a solution to destroying the resin, something that will dilute the compound. Darcy says that that's it. They have to crash the convoy into the river. The voice returns asking, is that why you brought Darcy? She's always the smart one. You knew that this would happen. You just didn't want to admit it because it would have meant that you doomed Spoiler and Darcy. As the three make their way to the bridge, Spoiler asks if he's okay. She thought that he, the voice responds, died. She thought he died. She lived through him dying in front of her so many times, each getting more painful than the last. She knows that he is the reason for her pain. And one of these days, he'll be the final nail in her coffin. Won't he? Tim smiles. Not if I can help it. As they reach the giant metal door, Spoiler asks what is the plan, and Tim begins to pry the doors open with his strength, telling them to take them down. Save Gotham. Inside, Peacekeeper 13 loads his gun. That was quite an impressive show. Thank you for being the guinea pig. We knew someone would come for the resin. As they cut open your dead body, we're gonna see what it does to a human. Peacekeeper 1 will be pleased. The voice tells Tim that he's lying. Is he going to let him speak to him that way? Perhaps he isn't the son of the bat. Tim yells to Spoiler and Darcy to stay back and he charges in head first. He begins to take down each of the soldiers and 13 says that this is magnificent, taking down a highly skilled operative with his bare hands. But as he squeezes on the man's neck, Spoiler tells him to stop. The resin, it's doing something to you, Tim. You're going to kill that foot soldier. That's not what Batman taught you. The voice tells Tim that she is weak, always has been. She doesn't know what you have to do to keep her safe. And Tim shouts, you don't understand. No one ever understood what I had to do, what I have to do. But a spoiler pleads, the soldier runs up cuffing her. At that moment, Darcy yells as the shadowy figure grabs her and says, they are all distractions. They always have been. You know the real mission. You have to kill him. It's the only way to be free, Tim. You've always been the most like him. Other there's a doubt. Think that you don't have what it takes to keep the family safe. That you're not strong enough, not smart enough. Tim lunges in, punching the shadowy figure, shouting, I'm not Batman. And 13 falls to the ground, freeing Darcy, but Tim can feel the resin fading, almost like it's scared. Serotonin, maybe? Darcy activates the controls to send the convoy down, and she can see that Spoiler was taken away. Good. She didn't have to die here. But nothing could kill him though, he's already dead. As the convoy passes some nearby buildings, Tim grabs Darcy, jumping out the window. He planned this part, calculated it. Trajectory to the building is just enough that he can do one last thing before. Tim throws Darcy onto the ledge, saving her, but ends up plummeting to the depths below. Tim tells Bruce that he's coming, but before he could finish that thought, he slams into the water. Darcy calls out to him, fearing the worst, but at the last moment, a hand reaches out of the water. The Gotham train station. The guards continue to yell over the loudspeaker, ordering the children to board the trains and leave everything they own behind. Selena stands nearby, watching as the kids board. 
The captain of the guard stands with Miss Canaris as the children board, and he smiles, explaining that the magistrate will bring order to Gotham City, and that the White Port Reformatory will help teach the children to work towards the common good of Gotham. Suddenly, a man breaks from the crowd, yelling about how the magistrate are fascists, and that they wouldn't dare do this if Batman was still alive. The guards move quickly. They beat the man until he falls, blood pooling beneath him. And Selina watches. She raises her hand and she makes a gesture. The crowd around her mirrors the gesture and they begin to chant. Here, many have lived and lost. In the cold nights and the long days, we follow none. But we will always have each other. And there will always be strays. The children chant. The guards raise their weapons, ordering the children to stop and board the train. And Mrs. Canaris asks the captain if they should board the train, since she needs to include a section on the facilities to her report to Peacekeeper 01. In a short time, the train pulls away from Gotham Station, revealing graffiti that reads, The Batman Lives. Meanwhile, in the snowy hills that surround the train station, Selina preps her suit and bike, while her tech rattles off specs to her. She nods, setting her watch, and marking the timers to the Pullman Bridge. Her other support, Cheshire, moves forward to remind Selina that she'll be on her own on the train, against all of the guards. But Selina reminds them that she has some help on the inside and ignores the other arguments and tells her support to stick to the plan. She revs the engine on her motorcycle and rides into the snowy night. On board the train, Billy whispers to his friend, Skidmark, asking if the young man managed to steal the keycard from the card. Hand it over. We got about 15 minutes before I'm going to need you to create some sort of distraction, Billy tells his friend. Meanwhile, over at Pullman Bridge, Selena revs the motor, launching herself into the air just as the speeding train passes beneath them. The motorcycle careens into the night air as Selena jumps clear, landing with a magnetic jolt onto the top of the train. Inside of his van, her techie breathes a sigh of relief that the suit did its job. We got about 12 minutes to get inside before the magnets power down. Otherwise, you're gonna get thrown off. He reminds Selena over the radio. Key, thanks, Leo. Regular ray of sunshine you are. Selena gasps as she pulls herself along the roof of the train car, hoping the kids keep her schedule. Inside of the car, Skidmark suddenly shouts to the guard, telling him that he has to pee. The guard waves his weapon, ordering the kid to sit down. And meanwhile, Billy stands up, swiping the card to open the car door. Okay, Selena, please be there when the door opens, he whispers as the guard turns and begins to shout at him. The guard raises his weapon as the door opens, but a whip flies through the opening, wrapping around his hands. The guard is then yanked off of his feet and pulled through the door to see Selena's smiling face. Hi, bye, she waves as the guard goes tumbling into the night. She slips into the car, gathering the others around her. In the control car, the guards note that one of the train cars has been opened. The guard looks down, ordering some extra guards to be sent to car 12 to check it out. When Miss Canaris questions why they have extra personnel in car 12, he explains that 12 and 4 are where they keep the high-risk prisoners. Would you mind if I had a closer look at the car? For my report? She asks. He pauses for a minute before motioning her through the door, asking that she follow all instructions from the guards. They're there for your safety, he reminds her. As she moves into car four, Miss Canaris finds six guards sitting and guarding a single bearded man in a high security cage. Meanwhile, Selena stands before Billy, telling him that she will move through the cars and send the prisoners back to him as she goes. How are you gonna get us off the train without being noticed? He asks her, but Selena smiles. We don't need to get off the train at all. Not if we steal it, she tells him. She moves quickly through car 12, flipping and beating her way through the guards easily. She pulls a keycard off of one of them and opens up a special cell and gasps when she sees the prisoner within. Blip blop, he says simply to her. Yeah, you're the one that only speaks in sounds, right? Anamanapia? She asks, leaning against the door. She offers to let him out as long as he helps her fight her way through the train. Then you walk free. No questions asked. We got a deal? She asks him. The villain holds a thumbs up and Selena releases him, taking the time to pull gear off of one of the thugs and make a makeshift mask, using one of the guards' blood to draw a swirl on it. You ready? Selena asks as the guards begin to enter the car. Whip crash! Automatopia says as Selena leaps into the guards. Inside of car four, Miss Canaris asks the guards what the issue is. But he smiles, telling her not to worry about it and that the captain will take care of things. I'm staying by your side to ensure safety, he tells her. Oh. How unfortunate for you, she says as she pulls free a knife, stabbing the man in the throat. He gurgles, falling to the ground. Turning back to the prisoner, Miss Canaris removes her wig. Can you hear me? It's Talia. Bruce, 
She asks, and inside of the cage, Bruce looks up. Catwoman gets over the comms, asking if Cheshire has arrived at her location yet. There's a long pause as no one answers. Then Cheshire comes over with egg front. Ugh. Give me a second. Little busy. She hisses as she wraps around a guard's neck. She kicks out, knocking another guard before finishing off the first one. As she breathes heavily, she gets back on the radio. I'm here. She puffs. She tells Selena that the place is crawling with guards and she's trying to keep their big surprise a secret. She moves through the facility, placing the last of her charges. Back at their base, Leo reminds Selena that once the charges go off, she'll have about 30 minutes before the magistrate can reroute power back to the rail. She'll be in the longest tunnel inside of Gotham, so she'll have no eyes on her. There's no response, and Leo keeps calling her name. I'm here, she finally gasps, leaning up against the wall. Unconscious guards all around her, blood dripping from several wounds in her body. Just taking a breather before I head out the front coaches, she tells him. 18 seconds later, the charges go off and the train loses power. The guards are all confused in the front of the train, while the children continue to work their way to the back. But at the center, Selena has slumped over on her side. Her breathing is shallow as she begins to slip into the darkness. She stands over the casket of Bruce Wayne, looking down at the man that she loved. She begins to cry. She doesn't know if she can do this. She doesn't have the people. I'm no hero, she whispers, but a voice calls out to her and she looks over her shoulder. Batman is standing there, a looming figure in the dark. Bruce Wayne is dead. I'm all that's left. Batman growls, reaching out for her, telling her that she needs to wake up, that there is nothing in the dark but Batman. Now stand up! He snarls at her, opening his mouth again. Slap, he says. Selina opens her eyes. Slap! Slap! Onomatopoeia says as he rears back to hit her again, but Selena snatches his wrist. Touch me again and I'll tear your arm off. She snaps at him. The villain leans back, holding up his hand, pointing to the gas that is leaking into the car. Outside, the guard captain checks his readings, nodding as the men continue to pump the sedative into the car. Give it a few minutes and then go pick them up once they've hit the floor. He orders the soldiers. However, in the control center in the front of the train, the technicians look up to see the black cloak in the doorway. Bruce Wayne rushes in, sweeping through the guards before they can even get their weapons up. Okay, we're on a short window here, Bruce. No time for your eye idealism. Talia reminds the man as she moves to a computer and reminds him that the resistance is waiting for them on the other side of the tunnel. I don't care who's waiting or how long we've got, Talia. No killing! Bruce reminds her sharply as he knocks down the last of the guards. Thought there'd be more guards, Bruce notes, and Talia nods as she checks the computers, telling him that the rest of the guards are dealing with a disturbance in the back of the train. Bruce checks one of the screens, shocked to see a wounded Catwoman trapped in the car. Inside that car, Selina gets on the line with Leo, ordering the techie to overload the magnets in her suit to short-circuit the door. That's brilliant, but it's likely to do just as much damage to your hand, he warns her. Do it. It's what he would have done, Selina tells her friend. Boom, Onomatopoeia whispers, and the doors explode outward, scattering the soldiers on the other side. And as they stagger to their feet, they shout a curse as Catwoman comes flying through the door. She whirls amongst them, attacking with her whip, kicking the soldiers away. And she slashes another in the face, making her way to the captain of the train. But one of the soldiers cracks her in the back of the head with a pistol, knocking her down. The others kick her, finally pinning her down. You really should recognize when you're beaten, Selina. The captain smiles at her, and he looks down, telling her that it would have been better for her to stay in the car and just slipped quietly to sleep. He pulls out a pistol, putting it against her forehead. Any last words? And Selena looks behind her, her eyes widening, and she looks up at the captain. Yeah, Batman lives! She snaps, and Bruce cracks the captain in the back of the head, dropping him to the ground. And in moments, the rest of the guards are defeated. Selena looks back at Bruce in shock. Looks like bats have more than one life too, he tells her with a smile, and she slaps him in the face before finally moving in for that kiss. You're hurt. Well, you're dead. Talia looks out the door, reminding him that they need to get off the train. You really ought to rethink your plus one if you're going to crash my party, Selena tells him. You're not doing so great yourself, Bruce notes as he motions to Onomatopoeia. Bruce quickly fills Selena in on what happened, but Talia once again tells them that they need to get off the train. Selena nods, telling Bruce about the kids in the rear of the train and how she needs to decouple it. He helps her get to the rear of the train, telling her that there's an emergency decoupler. You're not coming with me, are you? She asks, and Bruce shakes his head. They're all gonna come after me, Cat. If I come with you, you'll be running the whole time. This way. They'll think I engineered the escape. I'll make sure of that. No one's going to miss two coaches when Batman blows up a train. The trains begin to separate. When it's done, Bat, how do I find you? 
And Bruce smiles at her as he drifts away. Just steal something important, Cat. The children cheer as they drift away. They manage to steal the train, getting everyone to safety. Left alone, Anamana Pia slips into the darkness. The rest of the train is destroyed with the captain of the guard chained to the wreckage. And next to him, graffiti has been left for everyone to see. Batman lives. A man runs down the dark alley, a mask covering his face. Masks have become illegal in Gotham, and Gotham has become a police state under the control of the magistrate. Their orders are to shoot anyone with a mask on sight. The man stops, looking back at the entrance to the alleyway before pulling out twin knives. But he looks up just as the Batman descends upon him. The man tries to fight back, lashing out with those knives, but Batman dodges, taking him down with a few well-placed punches and kicks. Hands where I could see them! The GCPD patrol shouts out, their lights forcing the shadows back. Batman reaches down, ripping the man's mask from his face, saving his life, even if it isn't worth it. The cops begin to read Batman is right, but he turns and shoots his grappling gun into the air and launches away. The cops stare for a moment before realizing the guy in the ground has a warrant and is known as the East Side Rapist. Forget Batman, let's take this skull in and take our promotions. Crouching on the gargoyle, Batman stares out onto his city. He knows that he shouldn't be tangling with the police, and he knows what the real Batman would do. Nah, check that. I'm the real Batman. He thinks to himself, leaping into the night air, prepared to protect his city. The next morning, Luke Fox comes down the stairs of his family's residence, his mother looking up, questioning why he's up so late, and wondering if he's going to work. Yeah, I just had a late night. He tells her, steering away from the questions. She nods, telling him to go visit his sister in the hospital today. Luke responds by telling her that he will, and he walks out of the room. Meanwhile, at little Santa Prisca, the leader of the Bane Litos stands in front of two young boys, telling them that the world doesn't care about them. Except us. We care. We're your family. So the question is, do you want to be a family? He asks them. The older brother nods, asking what do they have to do? Nothing. Just man up and blood in, the leader says, handing the older brother a pistol. Uh, can we talk about this? The younger brother asks, and one of the gang members tries to argue, but the leader cuts him off. Hey, they're brothers. Let them talk if they want to. The two brothers begin to argue, but the older brother explains that they need to get into the gang for protection. You're my little bro. You gotta trust me, okay? And the younger brother nods. See? Told you, we're familia. All you gotta do now is take a mask and be somebody. The leader tells them with a smile. He pulls out two Bane masks from his pocket and hands them over. Meanwhile, over at the hospital, Luke Fox opens up the door to his sister's room. What the hell? He demands in shock as he sees his brother sitting next to her. What are you doing? Visiting our sister, his brother says, looking up. Luke tries to tell his brother to leave, but Tim refuses. He reminds his brother that he was sent away, which is why he hasn't been around. You got out of the military academy years ago. You could have come home, but that wouldn't have meant owning up. Tim Fox does not own up. Luke snaps at his brother, and Tim reminds his brother that he goes by Jace now. But Luke isn't listening. You're still the Fox family screw-up. You have no idea what you did to the rest of us. And you have no idea what you did to Tam. You weren't here for her back in the day, so don't come around acting like you're here for her now. Jace shakes his head, and he walks out the door. Good to see you too, bro. That night, the pair of bandleaders drive the two young brothers around looking for a member of the Hypes to kill. When finally they see one and the driver points the vehicle towards them. Get your masks on and get ready, they order the young brothers. The boys pull on their masks and roll down the window and the older brother lifts the pistol, aiming down the sights. No! The younger brother shouts as he reaches for the gun, but the pistol goes off and the shot goes wide, striking the wall next to the hype soldier. The Bane Leto's begin to drive away as the soldier pulls out his own weapon. He ain't nothing! Turn the car around and run him down! The car roars in a turn, headlights illuminating the hype soldier as he opens fire, and Batman is suddenly there, knocking the soldier out of the way of the speeding vehicle. Save my life! The soldier gasps. Do something with it! Batman growls at him. The Bane Leto's are shocked to have seen Batman, and they look over their shoulders as they drive away, trying to see if Batman is following them, and with a thud of metal, Batman lands on the hood of their car. The Bane Leto's fire through the windshield, but Batman is gone again, and the gang members scream as they're suddenly plowing into a passing garbage truck. The two brothers run as Batman descends on the gang members once more. Grab the gun! Run, Eddie! The older brother screams, and Batman drops the Bane Leto's with two well-placed punches. He grabs one, demanding to know where the kids are from and where they're going. 
He knows that the peacekeepers will kill them. Man, I don't care about them punks. Let the cops smoke their hides, the Bane Leto smiles. Do me a favor. Stay here! Batman snarls as he knocks the man out with one punch. He follows the kids through the alleyway, appearing before them in a smoking night air. When the peacekeepers get here, they'll see you in those masks and you're dead. I can help. He warns them. The older brother orders Eddie to shoot, but Batman walks quietly forward to the young man with shaking hands, and he takes the pistol gently. You're gonna sell out your own brother? Nestor asks angrily. The peacekeepers suddenly appear at the entrance to the alleyway, lasers dancing around the area as they prepare to open fire, but Batman throws down a smoke pellet, grappling away. He takes the boys with him, and up on the rooftops, he holds them prisoner as Eddie looks at him with fear. Are you gonna put us in jail? Eddie asks as his brother dangles over the city. I'm turning you over to child services. What happens after that is up to you. Batman hisses at him. Batman looks over at his city. Today was a good day, but nothing ever changes in Gotham. Batman leaps down from the rooftops, finding a body left on the sidewalk. Wallet still in the victim's pocket, money and ID. This wasn't a robbery. He glances over his shoulder. He realizes that the magistrate would be here in about two minutes. He has no time for stealth. So the door explodes inward from the charge that he set, scattering tables and chairs within. He moves fast, kicking in the door to the security room, finding the footage. Two perps, both wearing hoods and polygon masks that hide their faces. Batman watches them beat the man to death with a hammer and a bat. They have no training, but they're brutal as hell. He holds up his phone, trying to send off images, when suddenly he hears the approach of Boots over the destruction that he caused. The magistrate is early. The soldiers clear the room with their weapons, but Batman descends from the shadows of the ceiling. He moves in a blur, kicking and punching. He grabs a weapon, whirling, bringing it down hard on the head of another soldier. He then turns, running through the building as the other soldiers recover and open fire on him. The window shatters as he leaps through, only to be greeted by more soldiers as he lands on the pavement below. Batarangs fly from his hands, bouncing uselessly off of the soldier's armor. He turns, fleeing as the soldiers open fire, but pain lances through his side as a round finds flesh. He turns, throwing the flashbangs to disorient his pursuers, but they keep coming, knowing that he has no escape from the alleyway. Suddenly, headlights ignite before them. Shoot him! Someone screams as Batman roars towards them on his motorcycle. He careens into traffic, driving fast down the street, swerving to avoid oncoming cars. Vol, you there? Batman growls over the radio. Da, I'm here. The voice responds, and Batman uploads the pictures, asking Vol to identify the attackers and the victim. Peacekeepers are setting up a perimeter. They're serious and about to shoot on sight, Vol warns. Batman suddenly looks up, cursing as he sees the magistrate drones approaching. They're tracking the phone! He hisses to Vol, skidding into a turn, telling Vol that he'll contact him later. But not on this line! The phone's burned! He snaps as he tosses the phone away. So a short time passes and Batman sits quietly in a shipping container. It's been six minutes and the magistrate hasn't found him yet, so he believed that he had lost them. He holds his wound, knowing that the compression packs built into the suit are keeping him from bleeding out. Tim Fox looks down at his helmet. How am I supposed to take on peacekeepers when I can't take magistrate foot soldiers? He thinks to himself. He puts back on the helmet before glancing outside. Pulling at another phone, he calls Vol, telling his support that they have 60 seconds before the magistrate tracks the call. Vol explains that there are no flags on the victim and he can't link the perps to any known gang. I ran a body tracer through the city's cameras, sending their location now. Vol tells him. The phone beeps as the GPS lights up and Batman thanks him as he boards his bike roaring into the night. The magistrate drones fly over the city and two hooded perps move as quietly as they can. But suddenly they look up and see Batman standing before them. They charge at him, but Batman moves fast, dodging and punching one hard in the stomach. The other tries to get around him, but he reaches out, grabbing the hoodie, throwing the person to the ground. Please don't hurt him! The woman shouts as she removes her hood staying Batman's fist from the further beating. You murdered him, why? Batman demands. Because he killed our daughter! The husband states as he removes his own hood. They explain that the man had preyed on their daughter online, that he asked her to come out and visit and she was never seen again. Batman stands, asking if the police investigated, but they inform him that there wasn't enough evidence to put the man away. What you did is still murder, Batman tells them, and the woman looks at him. He took our daughter. We have nothing else. What else can you do to us? She demands, but suddenly the trio is awash in spotlights. 
He's not the one you have to worry about. We are. The magistrate captain sneers as the trio turn to see the large magistrate force standing before them. As the magistrate surrounds Batman and the two killers of Lewis, all that can be heard is the clicking of rifles as they get trained on Batman. He holds up his arms, telling them not to shoot. He gives up! Don't hurt these two! And the officer asks Captain Stans what they should do. Stans says to shoot them all, and as everyone moves in, Batman tosses two EMP grenades into the air, causing the drones to start firing aimlessly into the crowd of magistrate officers. During the confusion, Batman leaps up bashing one of the robotic cybers and rips its arm off shooting another. Soon the smoke begins to fill the alleyway and stands yells to rally up and get eyes on Batman. He throws several small devices that latch onto the officers and shock them all seconds later. Stans then opens fire, but Batman rushes in, punching him in the gut, then uppercutting Stans, launching him into the air. With the smoke fully covering the alleyway, Batman pulls the couple out when a drone locks onto their position. Before being able to get on the motorcycle to escape, the drone fires a missile, blowing up the bike and quickly circling around him. Batman reaches for one thing, not in his utility belt. A rock. He hurls that rock at the drone's sensor, sending it to the ground, allowing Batman and the couple to escape. And a short while later, back at the command center, Peacekeeper 01 asks Stans what does he not understand about shoot on sight. He is a private cop paid to kill the Batman. Two cybers, two drones, eight men, and he couldn't even do that. Now, get your team ready and redeploy. Now! And don't come back until you're wearing the Batman's cape like it's a blood-soaked robe! Stans walks out of the control room and a few of his officers ask what are they going to do. Stans tells them that they're going back on patrol and they will capture all three perps. But he is going to be the one to put a bullet in the Batman. Meanwhile, over at the abandoned church, the wife of the couple asks what they're doing here. Why is Batman helping them? Batman says that they wanted to know if he believes in justice. Well, he does. They deserve a trial, not an execution. But would either of them have any medical expertise? The wife asks why, and Batman explains that once he removes the plate in his armor, I'm going to bleed out. Just take this flare. When I've removed the plate, light it and press it into the wound. The husband asks, isn't that going to hurt? And Batman tells him, it's going to hurt like hell, but it's that or bleed out. After taking a few deep breaths, Batman lifts the plate to show the gunshot wound from before as the wife presses the flare down to cauterize it. Once he's done screaming in pain from the flare itself, Batman covers the wound telling the two of them to be ready in five. They're moving out. Meanwhile, over at the Fox residence, Tiffany overhears her mother and father discussing the peacekeepers as well as the magistrate. Tiffany asks Tanya if she heard that right. Both of them are cool with private cops that can shoot on sight after everything that they've been told. Tanya says that this, this is different. Justice doesn't wear a mask or a hood and justice is never a vigilante, never. As Tanya leaves, Tiffany goes to see Luke in the garage and says that she needs to talk. Luke swings at the punching bag and asks what's up. She asks directly, are you Batman? Because if you are, you better knock it off. It's killing mom and dad. Luke tells her that their parents blame the masks for what happened to Tam. Dad never fully recovered from what Punchline did to him. And Tim, Tiffany says, Jace. And Luke looks back, whatever he calls himself, he isn't helping at all. Tiffany says that she's just worried. She doesn't know how she's supposed to feel about Batman. Luke looks at her and says that he's been behind the mask before. Anybody who's willing to go out at night and deal with the nonsense that Gotham serves up, they're good people. Back at the church, Batman gets ready to leave and he calls Detective Chubb, stating that he needs to talk to her. She laughs, stating that that's funny, because she needs to arrest him. He ignores the comment, stating that there was a murder tonight, and he has the two who did it. They deserve a trial. Chubb sighs, stating that she'll be at City Hall, and if he can get them there, she'll take them into custody. Batman says that he needs one hour, and Chubb tells him that that is all that he gets. And she can't promise that she won't shoot him either. So as Batman hangs up, he breaks the burner phone, telling the two of them that they're going to meet with. But before he could finish, the husband grabs a broken stick, cracking Batman right where his wound is. The wife shouts, asking what is he doing, and she tries to get him to stop. But the husband pushes her off, stating, he is not taking us to them. He then grabs one of the loose cables on the ground and wraps it around Batman's neck, stating, we might end up getting caught, but maybe they'll cut us some slack for killing Batman. 
The man pulls tighter, strangling Batman with his wife yelling for him to stop. But the man just pulls tighter and Batman knows that they are scared and trying to survive. But that doesn't mean they get to kill the Batman. He lashes out with his wrist blades on his gauntlet, stabbing the man in the leg. He loosens his grip as he cries in pain and Batman whirls, kicking him in the chest. Eric struggles to his feet, pulling up a rusted piece of rebar. Put it down! Batman growls with the wife asking him to drop the weapon as well. Finally, the piece drops to the ground and Batman looks up at both of them, growling. You don't care about justice, you're just trying to get away with murder. And Eric shakes his head, motioning to his wife. I'm trying to help Sarah get away, he tells the Dark Knight, explaining that killing Jahovsky was his idea. He looks at her, explaining that he was the one who actually killed the man. It's not true. I wanted him dead, and there's nothing I wouldn't do for my family, she says. Just to be clear, I don't care what you did or who did it. You're both going in. You come at me again, and I will dump you at the feet of the peacekeepers. Batman tells them both. They both nod, asking the plan. But there is no plan. Batman smashes through the window of an SUV, hotwiring it. They need to keep ahead of the peacekeepers and make a run to City Hall. 32 blocks from here, 3 miles. He tells them, handing them each a grenade, telling them to only use it if the peacekeepers get past him. You trust me with this? Eric asks him, and Batman stares for a moment. No, but I trust you'll protect Sarah, he says finally. They start moving, the SUV swerving around all of the Gotham traffic. It doesn't take long for the peacekeepers to show up. Peacekeepers! Sarah shouts in the backseat as three motorcycles pull up behind them on the road. They immediately open fire, rounds chewing through the soft metal of the car. Batman hits the brake, slowing the vehicle with a screech, allowing one of the bikes to plow into the back of them. He swerves, but the other bikes are on them in a matter of seconds. More gunfire ripping through the SUV's windows. Batman hands the woman a few discs, ordering her to throw them at the bikes. She tosses them out the window, allowing the magnetized weapons to bounce and attach to the peacekeepers and motorcycles. The electric grenades go off, tearing the bikes apart, throwing the riders to the concrete. Eric and Sarah look at the sky, but none of the Peacekeeper drones are in sight, and Batman nods, knowing that the Peacekeepers want to take them in person. If we're fighting people, I have to hold back. Eric looks at him in surprise, reminding the Dark Knight that the Peacekeepers are trying to kill them. You don't tell me how it's done. Not you. Batman growls at him, but the argument is interrupted as two magistrate armored cars pull up behind them. They ram into the back of the vehicle, shooting more rounds into the side of it. Batman tries to swerve to avoid them, but the vehicle is damaged, losing speed. We're not gonna make it, are we? Eric says as he looks at the Peacekeepers following them. Thirteen more blocks. No. We're not going to make it, Batman tells him, and the man turns around, reminding Batman that it was him who killed the man, not Sarah. He opens the door, and he throws himself onto the road. He bounces off the concrete, rolling as the peacekeepers get close. I love you, Sarah! I love you always! Eric whispers as he pulls out the grenade that Batman gave him. The explosive detonates, destroying the two armored cars as they pull closer, and Batman looks back at the road, swerving out of the way of a woman in front of them. They scrape against the other cars, finally coming to a stop, and Batman and Sarah get out, prepared to run the rest of the way. What the hell? Tanya Fox whispers as she watches Batman from her car. She gets out. Everything that she is trying to do is being ruined by this new Batman, and she pulls her gun, ordering him to stop. Jace pushes Sarah behind him, staring at his approaching mother. He has no choice. She doesn't know who he is, and he needs to stop her. He throws the battering, hitting his own mother in the shoulder. Just wounded. She'll be okay, he tells Sarah, and a voice yells from behind them as the peacekeeper captain steps from the wreckage, a knife in his hand. You don't care a thing about innocent people, and you wonder why people want you dead? The captain snaps. The fight lasted only a few seconds. The captain was good, but Batman... He's better. He blocked every blow, whirling and striking the captain with his feet and fists. He twisted the blade, stabbing it into the man's shoulder. And as that captain falls, Batman continues to bring his fist down on him again and again and again. Blood splatters on the ground until finally Sarah stops him. Enough for one night. Leave him. They keep running, finally arriving at the city hall. And they appear from the shadows, startling the waiting detectives. I got your suspect. Batman growls at them. Thought you said that there were two of them. One notes, and Batman tells him, the other one didn't make it. And I ask that you look into Lou Jaheski in connection to the little girl's murder. I didn't think that you'd survive the night, Detective Chubbs notes as her partner leads Sarah away. Are you surprised or disappointed? Batman asks, and Chubbs looks at him, asking if his armor is bulletproof. Before he can answer, the cop pulls her pistol, shooting Batman in the chest. She walks over, staring at this Batman as he struggles to stand. Sorry, 
by the laws, when Matoya asked, I did my job. In the future, take it easy with my phone number, she tells him. Batman nods as he rubs his chest. Later, Jace heads to the hospital to check on his mother, and as usual, Luke is on his case, noting that Tim either looks like he's on drugs or is drunk. But Lucius tells his oldest son to stop, ordering Jace to go in and see his mother. Tim sits next to his mother, who tells him that Batman tried to kill her. Batman is good at what he does. Maybe he was just trying to... Jace begins, but his mother shakes her head, telling him that Batman is dangerous and must be stopped. But Jace shakes his head. He tells his mother that she just needs to worry about getting better. Let's worry about being a family, he tells her as he takes her hand. The skies pour down upon Gotham Cemetery, and in the distance, a backhoe digs another plot for another body. No one sees the man staring through the chain link fence. Bruce Wayne, son of Gotham, shot and killed last month in the alleyway. Bruce ran, the wound in his stomach leaking blood all over the place. Bruce Wayne, we know who you are. Peacekeeper 01 called as Bruce fled. Now Bruce turns and walks away from the cemetery fence before anyone else can notice him. He finds himself in a cafe, broken, unable to even afford any food. Take a seat, I'll be with you in a sec. The guy behind the counter calls, not even bothering to look up from his phone. The girl next to him begins to talk, mentioning how both Batman and Bruce Wayne have died this month. Makes you wonder who's next. Celebrities always die in threes, you know. She mentions quietly to him. But Bruce is barely listening, staring at the ketchup that she is pouring on her fries. Then, Bruce pounded on the door. Open up! I can pay! He gasps shortly, falling to his knees, blood still leaking from the wound. We're back to when he was shot. We're back to where this started. The best butcher in Gotham opens up the door, and Bruce hands over the last of the Wayne fortune, seeped in his own blood. Take a seat and try not to die while I prep, the butcher says, motioning to the operating table. Bruce grimaces as the doctor works his magic, pulling the bullet out of his torso. What'd they shoot you with? The butcher questions. It was the next day that Peacekeeper 01 made it official. Batman had been shot and killed. The magistrate promised to continue their war against violent criminals and the vigilantes of Gotham City. Now, with all of that gone and him supposedly dead, Bruce stands in the center of Gotham looking up at the flashing lights of the billboards and the ads. The people walk by, stuck in their own virtual world, unaware of the tragedy going on around them. It's a city that Bruce no longer recognizes, but he stares at his face, displayed for the world to showcase the death of Gotham's favorite son. And he runs. This is all too much for him. He finds himself in the darkness of an alleyway, but the city won't let him die. Not really. Hey, let me go! A man screams. Shut up, is the reply as Bruce looks up, and at the end of the alleyway, three thugs are holding a man at gunpoint. I said shut up now, one shouts, and Bruce places his hand on the thug's shoulder. Let him go, he said simply. The thug whirled around with a knife, but Bruce easily blocks it, punching the goon hard in the stomach. The others move, but Bruce whirls, kicking one in the face. Suddenly, the fight is interrupted as peacekeeper sirens sound. Bruce turns distracted, only to catch a punch from one of the thugs in the face. The goons scatter as the alleyway is lit up by the magistrate drone. Stop our movement, it commands, but Bruce doesn't hesitate. He runs hard down the alleyway in a split second. The drone is joined by others, their searchlight following Bruce as he pushes as fast as he can. The wound in his stomach pulls, he feels it tearing open, and he reaches into his pocket, pulling out his mask. He puts it on. Stop all movement! By the order of the magistrate, the drone commands, as Bruce pulls off his civilian clothes to reveal the body armor beneath. His grappling gun fires, and Batman is yanked from the ground. The drones open fire, and a stray round nicks Batman in the leg. He can feel the wound in his stomach on fire. It was his technology and company that built the magistrate. But that just means that he knows how to burn it all down. He grits his teeth. Funeral's over. The young punks sneak into the warehouse, intending to steal the barrels within to sell. What they don't see is the dark night watching them from the shadows above. Suddenly a siren whoops in the darkness and one of the cybers comes exploding through the wall. You are in violation of private property restrictions. The cyber shouts as it reaches for one of the kids, but Batman leaps from the shadow, standing on the robot's back. He knocks it to the ground, reaching for the wires on it. But an arm comes out of the smoke, grabbing him by his arm. Damaging magistrate property is a city offense. The second cyber shouts. Images begin to flash through Bruce's mind. 
of crawling down an alleyway after being shot, of Peacekeeper 01 reaching for him. He whirled, firing the grappling gun into the enemy, knocking him away, buying Bruce enough time to struggle to his feet and run. Why would the leader of the Magistrate ambush Bruce Wayne in an alleyway? He didn't have an answer then. He dashes for the dock, gunfire erupting from behind him. A bullet slashing through his thigh, so he throws a battering which lands into the wood of the dock and did nothing. He leaped through the air, hitting the water, diving deep as the bullet splashed all around him. He began to sink, his lungs burning, but that's when he saw death staring back at him. The John Doe looked remarkably like a dead Bruce Wayne. He pushed the body up, allowing it to buy him a few seconds as Peacekeeper Zero One emptied his weapon into the corpse. But Bruce had a stroke of luck. It turned out that his last electric grenade wasn't a dud, and the battering exploded, throwing Peacekeeper Zero One away, buying Bruce more time. He swam as hard as he could, finally pulling himself onto a beach in the distance. And for a while, Bruce merely sat there, feeling the life drain out of his body until finally, a look of determination was on his face, and he pulled himself up. Now, Batman stands, the second cyber having fallen to a sharp object in the eye. He drags the robot away, ripping off the arm, storing it in his backpack, and quickly, he changes to his tactical gear, making his way through the city. Since his death, Bruce has had to relocate, something significantly cheaper than Wayne Manor. He steps into the small house and hears the cocking of a gun from the next room. He calls out to his roommate, Noah. It's Jeff, remember? Your roommate? Bruce calls, and Noah steps into the room, holding an old rifle. You got a cell phone? No cell phones. Noah orders him, and Noah puts the rifle away, telling Bruce that they don't drink the tap water anymore. The aliens are putting mind control chemicals in it. The door opens, and Noah's daughter walks in with several bottles of water. Bruce greets her before heading down into the bunker, which has been converted into a room for him. He pulls out the cyber arm, going through it, looking at his theory board. The equipment of the Magistrate seems to come from three companies. Bruce pulls on his tactical gear. He knows what's next. He has to follow the money. Bruce rolls through the city, heading into the Plexi Tech Corporation. It's one of the three companies that provides goods to the Magistrate, all of which didn't exist before the Joker War. He slips over the wall of the factory, moving through the shadows until suddenly he stops. Something is moving. Something small is buzzing around and it seems to be scanning. Batman reaches for his hand, grabbing a small robot just as the alarms begin to blare. He starts to run as the Magistrate drones begin to close in on him and he revs the motorcycle's engines, racing through the city streets when suddenly the drones finally catch up to him. They find that the bike has been abandoned. And back in the bunker, Bruce studies the small robot. It seems to be some sort of micro-surveillance drone. Its cloaking tech has failed, which was the only reason Bruce was able to find it. But that's when Bruce realizes that they knew where to find him. They knew that killing Bruce would mean killing Batman, because they had been watching. The Magistrate had eyes all over the city, observing everyone without their knowledge. Suddenly, he hears a smash upstairs, and Noah is shouting about how they're always watching. And he pokes his head out the door to see Noah going at the TV with a baseball bat. Hey, Jeff! You got TV down there? You gotta get rid of it! They're everywhere! He shouts, and Bruce looks at the crazy man. Yes. They are, he thinks to himself. Carl Bennington, Plexi Tech CEO, is a terrible golfer, but he is the organizer of many charity golf tournaments. He once played a Bennington tournament. It was his game, his rules. And really, the only rule was, for Carl, that there were no rules. Now Carl Bennington is dead, shot in his own home playing his own game. The magistrate announced the murder was suspected to be connected to the vigilante activity. Of course, actual vigilantes would have every reason to kill a corporate tick like Bennington. But why this corporate tick? Possibly had something to do with CB Enterprises, which is a flimsy shell company Bennington set up to expand his market. CB Enterprises was working foreign markets, selling cutting-edge technological advances in surveillance. Plexitech is one of the two companies that were in the process of developing and manufacturing the magistrate's next level of law and order surveillance. Micro surveillance by cloaked nano drones. Most people are used to the idea of being watched, but what level of surveillance are you into when you need to murder a man to keep it a secret? That's why tonight it's time to do a little fly fishing. But that's the problem with these new drones. You can catch them, but they have a tendency to explode if they are obstructed. 
Thankfully though, there are enough of them that after a few tries, one would perfect the art of them not detonating. Just need to not get caught by the others in the process. Bruce swings his grappling hook and starts to make his way to the grounds, landing on one of the drones in the process. But as one follows, it is destroyed and Bruce looks back asking who's there. Batman walks away telling him, we both know who. Now who are you? Bruce gets up, seeing that now someone else is in his original suit and tells him that he's busy. And Batman tells him, whatever you're busy with, it's not safe. As the two walk their separate ways, Batman says, make sure to stay home tonight. And Bruce scoffs, telling him, I pretty much invented that line. Now that that's over with, it's time to see what information is kept on these drones. And that's it. It's everyone, all the time. 24 hour surveillance in the streets, in people's homes, blowing past an invasion of privacy laws to full Panatacon. And 26 minutes before the public police reports estimated time of death of Bennington, peacekeepers. If this was peacekeepers and this job goes to the top of the magistrate, like Gotham shining new force of justice, assassins. Does the magistrate want the tech from these companies? Is that why Carl Bennington and Bruce Wayne had to die? So that others couldn't get it? Now as Bruce tries to wrap his head around that, he overhears Noah's daughter Hannah telling him to get off the roof before he falls and hurts himself. Noah yells that he has the damn right to protect himself from alien signals. We need this signal interrupter, Hannah. Hannah sighs telling him that aliens are both rare and very busy. They're not watching him, okay? But Noah yells, I hear something! As he finally comes down and looks back inside, Hannah sees Bruce asking, what is he doing? Did he help him put that stupid thing up there? And Bruce says that he was going to take it down. But what's the harm in it being up? Hannah says, does he want to live next to the beeping house? People are complaining. And you know what the problem is? It's guys like him and her father who just sit around and talk about all the wrong in the world without doing anything to actually fix it. So next time, instead of talking about strange noises and alien signals with her dad, he could try to help him not die by keeping him off the roof. As Hannah leaves, there's something that she said that sticks in Bruce's mind. Noises. It's time to take out the new infrared specs made with Noah's swimming goggles and some tech pulled from a cyber. Bruce goes out onto the roof and he watches Hannah. Six nano drones. Why so many to watch her? She did mention that she had a lot of jobs. Bruce hurries down, tailing at Hannah just out of distance to see where she's going. Why is she so important? And of all the places that she pulls into, it's the magistrate headquarters. But wait, Noah said that he could hear the noises. What he heard wasn't aliens. It was the sound of a thousand eyes in the sky, watching, watching them, watching him. What danger did he just walk these two into? Did he just step into a trap? Either way. No one can hide. Bruce rushes back inside and begins to bash the nano drones with a bat stating that they know everything. They knew who he is and they're coming. Inside the headquarters of the magistrate, Peacekeeper 01 orders a report on the new surveillance drones that have been sent out of the city. While his aide run downs the specs, 01 interrupts her and questions the rate of loss. Only a few units have been lost, but Zero One removes his helmet staring at her. Then they are not imperceivable. What you outlined is a liability, and until we account for every unit, we are vulnerable. I will not accept vulnerability at this point in our mission. I want reports on all missing and damaged drones, he orders the group. And after he dismisses the meeting, Noah's daughter, Hannah, stands to leave. The head of the meeting looks at her, telling her to have a report by the end of the day, and she nods, but is interrupted as her phone begins to ring. Dad, I'm at work. Can I wait? She whispers quickly as she leaves the office. It's Jeff! He's on the roof! Noah shouts crazily. Not wishing to argue, Hannah nods and tells her father that she'll be there soon. At their apartment, Bruce continues to make adjustments to the antenna that Noah had put on his rooftop. He flips the switch and begins to climb down, and as he reaches the bottom of the ladder, he pauses. Noah, I'm going to need you to put the gun down, he says quietly. A short time later, Bruce is in his basement apartment, finishing up on the computer. He grabs his gear and he heads upstairs. The apartment is quiet as he looks around. Suddenly, the door slams open and Hannah storms in, demanding to know where her father is, questioning whether Bruce is robbing him. He's safe for now, Bruce assures her. But she doesn't like his answer, continuing to demand answers. Hannah, I'm sorry. Bruce tells her, stepping forward, injecting a sedative into her neck. He quickly carries her outside, putting her into a van next to her father. 
As he drives away, the magistrate deploys at the apartment building, drones shattering through the window, scanning the rooms for the location of the signal that attracted them. But the drones only find a device with a countdown. Zero One realizes what is about to happen, yelling for his men to evacuate, and the building explodes, taking out the drones. One of the drone's pilots then reports in, informing Zero One that they didn't get a clear visual of the basement apartment. Find him! Now! Zero One demands. Hannah awakens a short time later, her father nearby, still passed out from drugs that Bruce has given him. There's water on the couch, you're probably dehydrated, Bruce tells her. He sits nearby, dressed in his most tactical gear. I need to ask you some questions, he tells her. Why did you drug us? She demands to know, and he nods, telling her that he needed to get them both somewhere safe. He looks at her for a moment before continuing. My name isn't Jeff, it's Bruce Wayne. I'm being hunted by the magistrate who had Noah's location. They raided it an hour ago. Now it's gone. They were coming to kill me again. I couldn't leave any evidence. Bruce begins to question Hannah about her job at the magistrate, about what she knows about their surveillance tech, and she holds up her small recording device, explaining that she's been gathering evidence for months. She's planning on exposing them. Bruce listened to a few, finally nodding. So the magistrate's plan is to install their own justice, with this surveillance at its core. Hannah explains that no one knows to the level that the magistrate is watching them. They've become judge and jury. She knows that eventually, the magistrate will move on from the vigilantes and their enemy will be anyone that they disagree with. Bruce stands up asking Hannah to stay in the bunker. I have cloaking tech on this place. They won't find you, he promises, and he leaves the bunker. Later, Batman stands on the roof dressed in full tactical gear, looking down at the magistrate headquarters. His coat flaps open in the night breeze as he moves fast, infiltrating the magistrate compound. Batarang disables cybers and Batman remains in the shadows. A well-placed bomb gets the magistrate employees to evacuate. And inside of the compound, Batman stops ordering the computer to locate Hannah Harris. He finds her in her office, downloading evidence from the magistrate computers. You have four minutes to get out of here. Batman growls at her. On the street below, one of his soldiers reports to Zero One that the explosives have been found and matched the signature from the apartment bomb earlier. He's in here, Zero One whispers as he walks to the entrance. Secure the building! In her office, Hannah pulls out the USB drive as she finishes. Batman grabs her, pulling her down the office as the drones begin to close in on them. Bruce Wayne! Zero One calls, launching himself across the room, tackling Batman. Hannah, run! Batman shouts as Zero One cracks him across the jaw. They struggle and Zero One kicks Batman through one of the windows, allowing them to tumble through the air. This ends now! Batman snarls. This is just the beginning. I'm going to save this city. I have the power now. No one can stop me, he tells him. Hannah keeps running, finally reaching the outside, but as she stops short, she sees a squad of cybers coming towards her. She looks down at the USB in her hand. Hannah, you can't swallow a vitamin, but you're gonna swallow this FOB, and if you throw it up, it'll be the end of democracy in Gotham. She whispers to herself, closing her eyes, forcing the equipment down her throat. Inside of the building, Batman and Zero One continue to trade blows as fires billow around them. But with each punch that lands, Zero One laughs. I burned it all down so that I could build a new city, my city, my order. Don't you think that I would kill you again to preserve it? This isn't your city, and you didn't kill me. Batman snarls at him. Zero One glares at him as they pause, and elsewhere in the building, the timer reaches zero. I'm burning it all down, Batman tells him as the magistrate headquarters erupts into a ball of flame. And there you have it, it should be concluding with a pseudo cliffhanger. You see, Future State never actually ended. It told us possible futures involving Gotham and the Batman family and what they could be doing against the Magistrate and Peacekeeper One and all these individuals, but it never truly ended because the way Future State works is it was possible futures, leading into Infinite Frontier, and then the question of, are we going to get to those futures? We're starting to build up a lot of these futures in the normal comic books. And so if you want to know what's going on in current Gotham City comic books, Batman-related stuff, make sure you check back at this channel every Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and we do weekly comic books talking about what is happening in comic books right now. And as always, you can support us by going to our Patreon, patreon.com slash comic historian, where by joining our mini producers here, you can get a vote on various comic books that we do here at the channel. Either way, guys, thank you so much for your continued support and watching this all the way to the ending. Let me know what you thought about Future State. Personally, I liked the idea behind Future State Gotham, but the fact that it didn't end kind of left me with a sour taste in my mouth. What do you guys think?